hmm, a dinosaur or something else? So, half the animals from 65. Unlike those scary fellows, though, this one actually existed. It lived in the Triassic period, and we don't know what it is. This is Smock. It might be a dinosaur. It might be a Ryosuchid. It might be a Prestosuchid, an Ornithosuchid, a Pseudosuchin, or a dinosaur. I already said that. This is a prehistoric unsolved mystery. One of many that hail from the Triassic. Seriously, what were they smoking in the Triassic? Things got really weird there for a minute. So, let's dive in and go on the trail of this odd animal. Let's see if we can't unearth what Smok Wawelski, our mystery animal of the day, really is. Smok was first found in Poland, hailing from the late Triassic period. We believe it lived for around 3 million years from 208 to 205 million years ago. The animal is noteworthy for a few reasons. One is that it's big for a Triassic animal. Smok was larger than any other known predatory archosaur from the late Triassic or even the early Jurassic in that area of Europe. So, so the first material of Smok that was found was part of a jawbone and the fragments of a skull. Well, Part of a skull is better than no skull at all, so he has a one up on a roaring right now at least. Smock was first described in 2008 as a theropod dinosaur based off what parts of the brain case we had, as well as the frontal bone. These fossils were also thought to come from two individuals, which that is really interesting. And the animal was given the name the Dragon of Lissaweiss, in reference to a creature in local folklore from the area it was found in. Smok Wawelski remains the only species in the Smok genus so far. Early on, Smok was thought to be the beginning of big things. Literally, it was thought that this was the earliest known ancestor to the Tyrannosaurus rex. More fossils were later found in 2009 and 2010. Now there's an interesting find which might be from Smok, or maybe something else. In the fossil layer above where Smok was found, so that means more recently in the past, the further down you go, the older the fossils get, a collection of five three-toed footprints were found. These are thought to be from a theropod dinosaur, but it is unknown if they belong to Smok because we don't have a fossilized foot of Smok. So, no foot for Smok, no skull for Aurora, and, and no body for Helicoprion. Let's combine them and create the ultimate animal. If someone can draw what that abomination would look like, I will subscribe to you. For now though, because we don't have a lot of fossils of smock, I'm going to move on to the next section. So what did smock look like? Or what do we think it looked like based on the fossils we have? Well. Reconstructions vary depending on if the artist is drawing it as a dinosaur, or as a Ryosuchid, or as something else. But, at an estimated 16 to 20 feet in length, Smok was the largest known carnivorous archosaur in Central Europe during the time it was alive. The skull alone was 20 to 24 inches long, so this was a large animal in the Triassic, larger than any other known theropod dinosaur or pseudosuchian living in Central Europe in the late Triassic period. Noteworthy features that show Smok as an archosaur include its serrated teeth, the contact between the jugal and the quadratajugal, that is a scary word, the quadratajugal bones at the back of the skull, a hole in the front of the eye socket, sometimes called the anteroorbital fensta. I'm not a biologist, by the way, so these words were above me. Aside from all that, there's also specific bones in the upper jaw that tell us it is an archosaur as well. There is also a specific rounded projection on the upper part of the femur bone that is common to archosaurs. Smok also has these really long endoraptor-like arms going on too. Also, I mentioned the brain case earlier, but let's bring it up again since skulls can tell us a lot about the animal, something that I've mentioned in other videos. Usually in cases where we don't have one, but it would have been very helpful if we did. 
The brain case of Smock has many advanced features for an animal at the time, something important that I'll touch on later in this video. But you should know that this is a sign that it might be a dinosaur because their brains were more complex than other archosaurs like Ryosuchids. A noteworthy... A noteworthy feature is a funnel-shaped structure on the bottom of the brain case, which was formed by a rounded and very wide basis phenoid bone, which is the bone located at the base of the skull. It is directly in front of the bone that contains the opening to where the brain, brain stem connects to the spinal cord. In the skull, there is also a deep notch called the basis phenoid recess, which cuts into the back of this other bone. Now, the reason we don't know if Smock is a dinosaur or part of the crocodile line of archosaurs is because it has several features that are shared with both lines. This is the unsolved mystery of this animal. I know it might look like a theropod dinosaur at a casual first glance, but honestly, we don't know what it is. Smock, what are you? I wish you could tell us. Fine, if you won't, we'll riddles in the dark this one out of you ourselves. Though our fossils of it are limited, here are a few examples of some of the features on it. The features on its bones that resemble theropod dinosaurs and in hint at it being in that line of animals include the groove in the ilum bone, the uppermost part of the hip bone, which connects to the pelvis. Smock and known theropod dinosaurs also have an interior... Dear God, I'm not a biologist. Here we go, though. Trochanter on the femur, and a thing living theropods have, which Smock seems to share, are deep depressions of the basis phenoids on the brain case. Now, onto evidence of it being a Ryosuchin. Smock has a triangular, antiorbital, fentenstra, and a, conne and a connection between the... These words are going to be the death of me at this rate. Ectopterygoid and jugal bones of the skull that is split into two projections. There is also a distinctive ridge on its hip. This ridge is a defining characteristic of Ryosuchids. It forms a buttress over the femur, and this allows these animals to have a pillar erect stance. It is called that due to how the femur is arranged. Now, we'll come back to the hip structure later in the video because hip structure on Triassic archosaurs is really important. Smock seems to be most likely either a Ryosuchin or a theropod dinosaur, at least from what I see. I'm not a paleontologist, and as you can tell, I'm definitely not a biologist, but it also has features which seem to exclude it from likely being part of either of these archosaur family lines, an example being the way the teeth are organized. It's a special way, and it heavily implies it's not part of the early line of theropod dinosaurs, so I say again, Smock, what are you? You're the Frankenstein's monster of archosaurs. This mystery has gone unsolved since the late Triassic, and I don't think I'm going to solve it unless I go back to school, become a paleontologist, and dig up one of these guys myself. So even though we don't know much about this animal, or what it even is, we know a few vital things about it. First, it was a carnivore. We know this is true from the fossil teeth specimens. Smock was the largest predator in its environment, likely the apex predator of its little corner of the Triassic. Other carnivorous archosaurs it likely competed with were the Neotheropod dinosaur, Lillian Sternus, and the Ryosuchids, Polonosuchus, and Teratosaurus. But these animals were smaller than Smock. Smock's size was unrivaled by other archosaurs until the Jurassic. Smock was even bigger than an actual dinosaur named after Godzilla, Gojirasaurus. This animal also likely had a bite force to be feared, as we have fossil evidence that it could crush bones. Smock was a generalized predator. It ate what it wanted. Fish, any smaller animals, like dicynodonts, non-mammalian therapsids, and Smock's ability to retain food in its digestive system varied depending on the amount of food available and the type of prey it was. 
There is also trace evidence that Smock swallowed its own broken teeth when feeding so it could grow new ones. That's pretty metal, actually. Loose tooth? Eat it! There was also a heavy amount of salt and bone marrow in Smock's diet from herbivores and other prey items, indicating that this was an important part of the animal's diet. These findings were published in 2019, so it's nice to see something recent in one of these videos. I'm sure you also remember that the auroran bones we talked about in my video on it have been locked away in a vault for 20 years, so no new news there. Now we come to the question of the day. Is Smok an early dinosaur, a Ryosuchid, a Prestosuchid, or a Pseudosuchian? Well, let's look into each of these, and I'll give you some information on them all, and then we'll look into the mystery itself by getting up close and personal with Smok. Since the relation it shares which, with each of these has not been studied in depth, Smok is kinda just drifting in limbo. It could be any of these, so let's look into them all. First, the early dinosaur, which early dinosaur evolution is kind of fuzzy and still a very complicated topic anyway. The line of archosaurs that became dinosaurs goes way back, but dinosaurs as a group first appeared in the Middle Triassic period. They sprung up only about 20 million years after the Great Dying, which that is impressive. They really just sprung up at the perfect time to just take over the world. They really did. I've talked about this before, why, but basically every piece was just in the right spot for them. There has not been such a perfect alignment for any animal in the Cenozoic, except for maybe humans. But even then, it's not really the same because we learned how to make boats. The pieces weren't qu quite in the perfect spot for us like they were for the dinosaurs. Anyway... This is not the point of the video, so let's get back to it. So when dinosaurs appeared, they were successful, though they had small beginnings. Literally, they started small and were not the dominant animals they'd become, or even the dominant archosaurs in the Triassic. Their main competitors were, at the time, the much more successful archosaurs, including the Pseudosuchians and the Ryosuchids. One of the earliest dinosaurs was Eoraptor, along with the larger Herosaurus. By the time Smok evolved, dinosaurs had diversified and gotten larger, leaving room for it to have been one of these dinosaurs which evolved at this time. A popular opinion online that I've seen is that people like to put it in the Pseudosuchia line, which is one of the two biggest divisions of the archosaur family, and this line led to the modern crocodiles of today. In fact, this line is known as the crocodilian line archosaurs. Though, ironically, Pseudosuchia actually means false crocodiles. Modern crocodiles and alligators and caimans and all the animals in that line are the only living examples of animals from that line today. But since this seems to be a popular place for people to put smock in, let's have a look at them next. Correcting my pronunciation, it's Pseudosuchia, by the way. The Pseudosuchians are a very diverse group. Some were even herbivores. Some were carnivores, and some were heavily armored, and some were bipedal, like Smok. Late Triassic Pseudosuchian Papasaurus, which looks kind of odd, I'm not going to lie. What's up with your tail, dude? Why does it have a hump? Okay, that's weird. But it was, bi but it was bipedal, so like Smok. Very nice. Anyway, Smok is theorized to have been part of the family of Ornithosuchid, Pseudosuchia, which were animals that were mostly walking on four legs and not two, but they could on two when needed. If it was part of this family, it would mean that Smok would be a closer relative to crocodiles instead of dinosaurs. Pseudosuchia were at their peak in the middle to late Triassic period. They were very successful and large animals, which lived many different lifestyles, especially compared to their descendants today, the living lines of crocodiles. Many of the groups Smok might have been a part of went extinct at the end of the Triassic or in the early Jurassic. 
Next, let's talk about the Ryosukids. This group first appeared in the early Triassic, and they were common throughout the rest of the Triassic. Now, on screen is a reconstruction of a Postosuchus skeleton, a large carnivorous animal from this clade. A group thought to be part of this family of animals are also the Papasaurids, which actually had some two-legged carnivores in the group, so that might support Smok being part of this group of archosaurs. I touched on that a minute ago, but I bring it up again because Ryosugids themselves are part of the extended Pseudosuchia clade. Postosuchus is reconstructed as either walking on four legs or up on two. It kind of varies. But if it was fully bipedal, then that adds another point to the case of Smok being in this family. Ryosukids were large also, believed to be up to 20 feet long and more. Finally, let's talk about the Prestosuchids. They are part a polyphyetic grouping, which polyphyetic is an assemblage of mixed animals from a shared evolutionary origin. And they are the largest group of carnivorous archosaurs which lived throughout the Triassic period. Usually, they were the largest terrestrial apex predators in their region. Like the giant four-legged carnivore from 65, yeah, basically the Triassic period's equivalent to that monster. Though not that big. The longest was 23 feet long. Smock was 20 feet long, so right on the edge of the larger animals that the larger animals got to, and, if you also remember, this is one of the groups it is theorized Smok might belong to. Also like Smok, this branch of animals reached into Europe, which... Okay, really isn't that surprising since all the land masses were connected at this time. So I introduced you to them all. Now, what is Smok? Well, we know it's an archosaur. It has features thought to be unique to dinosaurs, such as the... Oh, here we go again with the complicated words... I want to go back to talking about missing ships. At least that's terminology I can pronounce. Okay. I was never good at biology, if that's not obvious. But I love paleontology, so I suffer through it. Smock has features thought to be unique to dinosaurs, such as its supratemporal fossa, three sacral vertebrae, a groove extending into the ilum, and a few more features. But it also has features commonly found and often seen only with Ryasuchids, including a triangular antorbital, fling like palatal processes on the premaxillara and the maxilla, and a buttress on the lateral surface of the ilium, which is part of the hip bone, along with a specific ridge on the hip. Basically, this animal is a mix. And since I brought it up, one other thing I want to focus on is the hip bones, for a specific reason. You see, usually the hip can tell us if a Triassic period archosaur in question is a dinosaur, or a prosuchid, or a ryosuchid, uh, but no, not here. The hips are just a mix of them all on this animal, and the hips don't lie. In summary, Smog possesses features found in the crocodile and dinosaur line of archosaurs. It was one of the largest archosaurs of the time, but it doesn't have a, trace, a trait that tells us where we should place it in the family tree. It gives people, it gives paleontologists and people who just love this stuff like me a headache. So that's my answer to the mystery. We don't know. We don't know what Smock is. We need another specimen, like a whole lot of other animals too. Ideally, a well-preserved one. I'm sure there is one out there. But until we find it, we just have to speculate. Oh, you think Jaws is scary? Oh, you've seen nothing yet. This family of shark-like fish holds a special place in my heart because one of them, the genus Adestus, has a very unique set of teeth which inspired one of the characters from my original upcoming book a hybrid dinosaur called version 2. And while I'd love to make a video on Adestus someday, it's on a very, very long list of stuff I want to talk about, today is not that day. Today, we'll be covering the story of its larger relative, Helicoprion. 
the shark-like fish with a set of teeth that resembled a buzzsaw. I'll be covering the discovery of the animal, how many species belong to the Helicoprion genus, the paleobiology of the animal, the world it called home, and then its ultimate extinction. It's time to meet Jaws' scary older brother. So the striking thing about Helicoprion is, of course, the buzzsaw mouth. Need I say more? Yes? Okay. Like most cartilaginous fish, we don't have fossils of the skeleton itself, just the teeth. Nonetheless, despite only really having teeth, the fossils are very widespread, so the genus was definitely successful. It certainly evolved its odd-looking jaw for a reason, and its success shows that it was a good trait. Helicoprion fossils have been found in Russia, Western Australia, China, Japan, Laos, Kazakhstan, Norway. Man, Norway can't catch a break in these documentaries. Fossils have also been found in Canada, Mexico, and the western and central regions of the United States. And out of all of the fossils we have, around 50% of them are from the species Helicoprion davisi. And these are mostly from Idaho. Which makes sense, because Idaho was under the ocean at the time. Most of the western United States were. You know that new movie 65? Imagine if there was a film like that, but instead they crash in a Permian Ocean and these fish come at them. That's a scary idea. Someone get on that. While on the topic of different species of Helicoprion, there are currently three. Helicoprion davisi, Helicoprion bessonowani, and Helicoprion irgasemonan. I hope I pronounced those right. If not, I am terribly sorry. I could not find pronunciation guides. There are also three synonyms of Davizi. One synonym of Bezawani, and there are also three other intermediate species as well. Just remember that out of all of these, the first three species named on screen are the only ones considered valid. And, and telling the difference between them can actually be a bit difficult, because the differences only become apparent in adult individuals past the 85th tooth in the spiral. Some whorls have also been found which are hard to describe to or can't be described to any currently known species. An example of this would be Helicoprion specimen IMNH14095, which has unusual teeth that don't really match any currently known species. A few other specimens that are kind of anomalies have popped up here and there, but have yet to have a consensus on them reached, and a few have even gone missing since they were originally found. Davizi, which was originally thought to be an Adestus, actually, was discovered in 1886. It was discovered by Henry Woodward, a geologist and early paleontologist following the establishment of the field. Irgasus Simon you know what, we're just going to call it Helicoprion species E, was discovered in 1966, and Bessanawi, same thing, we're going to call it Helicoprion species B from here on out, was discovered in 1899. It's really interesting how far back some of these species were discovered. These are the early days of paleontology in some cases, back when they thought Stegosaurus was a theropod and Megalosaurus was a quadruped. Almost all of our Helicoprion specimens are known from the tooth whorls, which you can see on screen now. On these whorls, the tooth size increases away from the center of the spiral, with the largest teeth being over 4 inches in length. You can see the increase in tooth size in this picture. And while we only have pieces of this animal, these pieces can tell us a lot about them. Such as the fact that these shark-like fish got big. Like, basking shark big. Seriously, if you look up a picture showing the size compared to a human, you'll never be afraid of jaws again. Now, as you can see from the picture on screen, the whorls kinda spiral around itself. Now, like I said in the Anatosuchus video from a few weeks back, I am not a paleobiologist, so some of the biology terms kinda escape me a bit. But I'm going to explain this to you the best I can, and thankfully this stuff is not nearly as complicated as each individual bone in the skull of a little duck crocodile was. 
So take a look at the whorls on the diagram on screen. The lower part of the teeth form projections that are shingled below the crown of the previous tooth. And the lowest portion of the root below the enameloid tooth projections are referred to as the, quote, shaft. The shaft encapsulates the previous revolutions of the whorl, and in a complete one, which thankfully we have well-preserved fossils of this jaw, the outermost part of the spiral terminates with an extended root that lacks the middle and upper portions of the tooth crown. Now even though we have well-preserved fossils, sometimes it's kind of hard to put it into the animal itself. The diagram you see on screen is generally accepted how the teeth would go into the mouth, but there's also other ideas. One of the early ones even had the teeth whorls kind of forming a trunk coming down off the nose. I like the buzzsaw shark look more. Now, like I mentioned earlier, generally we only have fossils of the teeth and whorls from Helicoprion. Heck, I think this applies to all sharks and other cartilaginous fish specimens. Say that five times fast. I'm pretty sure teeth are all we have from even, you know, the much more recent Megalodon, let alone something around 300 million years older. There's only a few exceptions ever where any prehistoric shark fossilized more than their teeth. However, a, spe a specimen of Helicoprion davisi found in Idaho known as IMNH 37899, or Idaho 4, is the best known preserved specimen of the genus, with its upper and lower jaws being basically intact. The jaws were closed but preserved in three dimensions. This specimen was actually used to create the reconstruction you see on screen now. Thankfully, it allowed us to learn a lot about Mr. Buzzsaw here, because until its discovery, we didn't have any conclusive ideas about how its teeth, or the whorl itself, fit into its mouth. This specimen allowed us to actually see how the teeth went inside the mouth, and where exactly they were. Unfortunately, the part of the skull which would have housed the brain did not preserve but the fact something outside of the teeth and world did is still incredible. With any kind of shark or shark-like fish, any kind of bone preservation is exceedingly rare. So, on to this animal's paleobiology. First, we need to talk about why it has a Texas Chainsaw Massacre mouth. Scientists agree that the saw-like tooth structure and serrated teeth as well as the lack of wear on said teeth, implies Helicoprion likely ate a diet of soft-bodied animals like cephalopods or fish. Hard-shell prey, like ammonites, would probably slip out of Helicoprion's narrow jaws, which is interesting. I've read that its cousin Adestus likely evolved its teeth for hard-shelled prey like ammonites, so it's interesting that their diets would have been so varied. I suppose that's probably the case because Adestus lived in the late Carboniferous and not the early Permian like Helicoprion. So even though they both lived in the same widespread region, they wouldn't have had the same exact animals to prey on, with only a few exceptions uh, to that, like ammonites. The narrow shape of Helicoprion's jaws means it likely didn't suck prey in, but instead it bit down on them and likely sliced them apart with its buzzsaw-like teeth. It's also thought that the teeth had specific functions depending on where on the, on the whorl itself they were p positioned. The teeth on the frontmost part of the spiral were probably used to snag a prey and pull it into the mouth. Then the teeth in the middle would spear the prey, and then the teeth in the backmost part of the spiral punctured the prey and pulled them down into the throat. Helicoprion also likely bit its prey in a manner very similar to how modern sharks chomp down on their prey, again with its teeth cutting its prey with each bite like a saw blade. These bites also likely served as a method to initially capture and push prey deeper into the mouth before sawing through them after they were squeezed inside. It is absolutely terrifying to think about. If you were a fish and you were caught by Helicoprion, you would basically be filleted alive unless you got lucky enough to have the first bite slice your head off. Helicoprion also had a rather powerful bite force as well, meaning it could probably 
eat and cut through hard bones of vertebrates too, and probably allowed it to eat hard shell prey if it was in a pinch. And some scientists have put forth a theory that if Hard-shelled prey, we'll pick on ammonites again for this example, but eh, let's also throw nautiloids under the bus too, were bitten head-on. The teeth could probably forcefully pull it out of the shell and into the mouth like a spaghetti noodle. Other evidence also exists which suggests helicoprion could eat both soft-bodied and hard-shelled prey just as easily as the other, meaning anything small, hard, hard-shelled or soft-bodied could fall prey to that whirl of teeth and be sucked into the throat after being sawed apart and crushed. Maybe it preferred animals which were easier to bite through, but anything was fair game. So if you were a fish, you'd be flayed alive and decapitated by the whirl, and if you were an ammonite, when, then the whirl would turn you into prehistoric pasta before shredding you into pieces. Man, all of that is scary. That's just scary. Someone, please give me a 47 meters down spinoff with hel with a helicoprion. We've had great whites, we've had blind sharks, now let's have a prehistoric one for the finale. I don't care how unrealistic it is, I want it! This animal lived in the Permian period. If you don't know, that is the era that preceded the era of the dinosaurs. This was a rather important era of Earth's prehistory. It was the last period of the Paleozoic era, and it really set the stage for what was to come in the Mesozoic and even in the Cenozoic. Helicoprion as a genus was around from the Artenskane stage of the early Permian until the Rhodian stage of the later Permian. During the Artenskane, there was a global warming event known as the Artenskane Warming Event, or AWE. This period of global warming was basically the culmination of a warming planet following the late Paleozoic Ice Age, a Devonian era ice age, which is a whole topic in and of itself. Glaciers only remained at the polar region of Gondwana following this period of warming. For context, Gondwana was an ancient possible supercontinent, which existed from the Neoproterozoic until the Jurassic for roughly 370 million years, which was then when it began to break up. Some of the animals Helicoprion would have shared its subsurface world with, and swim alongside of, in the prehistoric oceans of the Permian include animals like sponges, rogus corals, brachiopods, and gastropods. Squid are also believed to have been an animal Helicoprion might have preyed on with some frequency. Such animals would have been very easy to slice apart with its serrated whorl of teeth. Xenacanthus was another animal which might have competed with Helicoprion for some of the same food, and likely would have also become prey to the much larger Helicoprion. Xenacanthus was only about the length of an adult human arm, and we've discussed already that Helicoprion was massive, and it would have given Jaws himself a run for his money. However, Xenacanthus was not just shark-like, but it was an actual shark and it would appear before and outlive Helicoprion, lasting from the Devonian all the way to the end of the Triassic period. Obviously, we can only speculate, but one thing I love when I make videos like this is reconstructing the ecosystems and speculating how the animals would have interacted with each other. Check out my videos on Auroran and the Cretaceous-era volcano in Louisiana for more of this kind of thing. Moments where I try to guess how these different animals would have interacted and where they might have lived. I love this aspect a lot because you can really just imagine so many scenarios. The top of the Artin scan is where the Conodonts genus, whose name I'm totally going to butcher here, so it's on screen, Neostreptogenethodus first appear as well. A Conodont is we'll just say an alien-looking thing. It's a jawless vertebrate with so many teeth that if it were bigger, it would give Helicoprion and every actual shark nightmares. Thankfully, these weren't large animals, but they make up for their small size with their sheer amount of teeth. Melosaurus, an Eerops-like animal, is another animal which would have been present in the later period of Helicoprion's time on Earth, during the Guadalupin epoch of the Middle Permian. The Guadalupian was the period 
in time, Helicoprion went extinct. During the Rhodian, the exact era Helicoprion vanished, there was Olson's extinction, a major loss of vertebrate life. We'll cover that more in the next section. Anyway, these mentioned animals and more would have shared their world with Helicoprion, and hopefully now you all have a better idea of this diverse world which was full of unique animals. Yeah, it's just a tiny glimpse into the whole picture, but it's a look through that window. Helicoprion as a genus lived for around 20 million years throughout the first half of the Permian. For context, the Permian itself lasted for roughly 47 million years, so Helicoprion was definitely successful in this very different world compared to Earth today. And that's important to remember. Helicoprion evolved the way it did because of its environment, but ultimately its environment changed and this unique animal was no longer suited for the new one that took its place. It looks odd to us because our only perspective is the world today, not the world then. You might be thinking that Helicoprion died out in the Great Dying, the famous Permian extinction event. But no, it died out in the earlier Permian extinction. I believe it died out in the aforementioned Olson's extinction, which was around halfway through the Permian. and. It saw a completely different range of biodiversity and ecosystems rise up afterwards when compared to the early Permian. This max extinction occurred roughly 273 million years ago, and it was the catalyst for the total change in early and late Permian era faunas. Basically, the first half of the Permian and the second half have completely different animals and ecosystems when compared to each other. Now that wasn't the end of the story. The order Helicoprion belonged to, the fish that had tooth whorls, lasted all the way until the early Triassic. And today, the closest living relative to Helicoprion are chimeras, also known as ratfish, spookfish, and, rather fittingly, ghost sharks. I say fittingly because as far as I know, they're all that's left of this family. So in a way, they are a ghost of the past that has hung on to the modern day. A past that is so far away from us, in some ways, really isn't completely gone. And that's kind of beautiful. So, y'all ready to get scared of a fish? Because you're about to get scared of a fish. A fish with a bite force so powerful, it would rival the Tyrannosaurus Rex itself. Of course, this paleo showdown could never occur in life, as Dunkleosteus existed around, we'll say, 370 million years ago as a nice round middle ground number. And Tyrannosaurus existed significantly more recently, closer to the iPhone than it was to the Stegosaurus, if that tells you anything, 66 million years ago. So Dunkleosteus, like I said in my video about Helicoprion, means a lot to me because it inspired the same hybrid dinosaur character I mentioned in that video. A dinosaur with Odessa's teeth and Dunkleosteus armor. Sounds like something we'd see in 65 at this point. Okay, enough with the jokes. Today I'm going to be educating you all about the Dunkleosteus, possibly the scariest fish to ever exist, and one I really wonder how it would affect life if it existed today still. I'm sure it would be a major danger to humans because its mouth was basically a guillotine. In this video, we'll follow the same format from the Helicoprion and the Equicanthosaurus videos. We'll cover the discovery of the animal, the biology, and the world it lived in, and the animals it ate, I mean lived alongside of, and then its ultimate extinction. Dunkleosteus lived in the late Devonian period from... 382 to 358 million years ago, give or take. There are 10 known species in the genus, and they are among the largest of the placoderms. Can you imagine digging in the dirt and happening upon this face staring back at you? How about this forward-facing view? Talk about nightmare fuel. Look at those teeth. Imagine sw seeing this thing swimming at you when it was alive. The first fossils of Dunkleosteus were found in 1867, and since then, 
specimens have been found across Earth, from the United States to Belgium. And unfortunately, our specimens are fragmentary. Only about 5% of Dunkleosteus specimens have more than a quarter of their skeleton preserved. This results in us still learning more about the animal and putting out new reconstructions of it today. From giant 30 plus feet long reconstructions to some which look like oversized beach balls. However, unlike something along the lines of Helicoprion, which we have talked about in another video, the head of this animal is preserved, so yay. We, we have finally escaped the lack of having a skull curse that has plagued some of our other topics. Looking at you, Auroran. Specimens of Dunkleosteus are on display around the world in various museums, such as the American Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, Yale Peabody Museum, the Natural History Museum in London, and the Cincinnati Museum Center. The original specimens are kept in the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. Some of these and other museums are just casts. The name Dunkleosteus means Dunkel's Bone. The name comes from the paleontologist who helped describe the animal, Dr. David Dunkel, and the type species described in 1873 was Dunkleosteus turelli. As I mentioned earlier, there have been 10 species in the genus described so far. They range not only in locations they lived, but also in size from species to species. Not all are the big goliath-sized fish that everyone recognizes. Torelli is the largest species though, and the most famous. You taking notes? Good, this is on the test. You get an F, you're fish food. Now you'll remember in my Helicoprion video, I talked about how we didn't know for a long time how the teeth and jaw fit on the animal. Well, we have a similar situation here. As I mentioned, we have fossils of the head of Dunkleosteus, but the body, no sale. We have no fossils of the body, so we have to stick the head we have onto the animal. And this is why reconstructions vary in shape and size. One popular one, though, is something that is heavily drawn from lobefish shape. Right, so we've introduced the fossils. Now let's move on to the description of the animal and then its paleobiology. We'll cover all of that in one section. Let's have a look at that chart again. There is a lot going on here. First, let's address the fact that the 2023 study of Dunkleosteus Torelli decreased the size of the animal substantially. Basically, at the moment, we're like, it's somewhere between 13 and 33 feet long. Somewhere, you know, it's margin of error, somewhere around there. Obviously, a giant 30 plus foot long animal is the one you always see in pop culture and the one Nigel Marvin swam with. But the smaller size was only recently determined from a study earlier this year in 2023. Some studies have used the jawbone to estimate the length. Others don't cite where they got their numbers from, oddly enough. The true size remains unclear, as I mentioned, so little the animal fossilizes. The 2003 study estimated the body size of Dunkleosteus Torelli using the orbit opercular length reasoning that the orbit opercular length strongly correlates with the total length in fishes and it can be used to get an accurate body size. They did provide references and pictures for this, but I don't know if I can show those in a video, so I'm just going to link the study below in the description and you can have a look at it if you want to see the pictures. This is where the much smaller animal size was calculated from though, and it was added that it is still likely vertebrates didn't reach truly large size to the later Carboniferous period, which, fair, Dunkleosteus T was kind of big for its time, relatively speaking, compared to other vertebrates. However, just because they were smaller than we thought doesn't mean I'd recommend taking a swim with one. The skull and jaw size haven't changed, so they could still deliver a bite worthy of a 17th century guillotine. In fact, if Dunkleosteus never went extinct, 
I bet it would have been offered as an extinction choice back then. You know, you get Firing Squad, Noose, Guillotine, or the Guillotine Fish. Now, what did the Executioner Fish, we'll call him, here eat? Well, first, it wasn't picky. You don't have to be as an apex predator, nor do you have to have good table manners. If you remember in Nigel Marvin's documentary about prehistoric oceans, we see a Dunkleosteus just throw up its last meal. Well, we have fossils of regurgitated food eaten by a Dunkleosteus, so this definitely was something that happened probably frequently. Dunkleosteus was basically Jaws before the Great White Shark. It was basically Megalodon before Megalodon jumped on the bandwagon 300 to 400 million years later. It ate sharks. It ate other fish. It ate younger members of its own genus. And it munched on other animals in the open water too, such as ammonite squid, fellow placoderms, and other cartilaginous fish like Erotus. And if they crashed on Earth in the Devonian in the movie 65 instead of the Cretaceous, I'm sure it would have eaten the two main characters as well. That'd be a scary movie. Instead of 65, though, you'd have to call it 358. From what I've read, it seems most of our specimens of the Dunkleosteus genus are from Torelli. We don't just have adults. We also have well-preserved fossilized juveniles, too, which still had a wicked set of teeth and beady eyes. No puppy dog eyes on the young of this animal. The juveniles were just as vicious as the adults, their bite forces were already something to fear. They could likely sheer prey apart just as easily as the adults could. Apex predators from birth. Speaking of juveniles, let's talk about how they were made. You like that? You're gonna get sex ed and paleontology all in one video. It is theorized that Dunkleosteus, along with other placoderms, were either among the first fish or the first vertebrates to internalize egg fertilization. It's the same thing you see in modern sharks today. There is also evidence that after the boogie-woogie was done, the young might have developed inside of the mother because we have what might be a fossilized umbilical cord as well. Though, this was found in another placoderm and not Dunkleosteus, I believe, so, we don't know for sure. So, write your fanfiction however you want. One other thing I want to note, while you stare into the gaping jaws in front of you, that one Dunkleosteus specimen, CMNH5302, has damage on it from puncture wounds thought to be from another Dunkleosteus. So these fish likely had a temper hot enough to make water boil and were not above attacking one another. Earth was not stagnant in the Devonian. Earth is rarely stagnant. It wasn't even truly stagnant during the Boring Billion. So, to keep it simple, we're going to cover the ages Dunkleosteus lived in, and not the Devonian as a whole. The Devonian as a whole could make an entire video easily, and others have done excellent videos on it in the past. But you should know, the Devonian is certainly an important era in Earth's past, and it basically shaped how the planet is today. It really set the stage for what was to come. Though life on land was still small, mostly bugs, and big animals still exclusively lived in the water, from what we know. But apex predators like Dunkleosteus might have actually pushed the smaller and more vulnerable fish to try going for land so they could get out of Dunkleosteus' reach. It's fascinating how life responds to threats. So, Dunkleosteus, the genus as a whole, not all 10 species, lived from 382 to 360 million years ago. This is the later Devonian, from the Frasnian to the Feminian Age. That was actually the last stage of the Devonian. It saw the Devonian mass extinction and the transition to the Carboniferous period. So, in the Frasnian, there was what is called the Charcoal Gap, or at least the second half of it. 
This was when atmospheric oxygen levels were below 13%, so wildfires might have been much rarer of an event than they were in the Carboniferous. So, animals at this time Dunkleosteia shared the oceans with. As I mentioned, early sharks were around at this time, though they weren't the top predators of the ocean yet. Planktons were around by this time and had been for a while, and actually, a decrease in their population likely caused the small extinction event at the end of the Frasnian. Basically, because they are the base of the food chain, if they go, things further up on top does too. It's basically just a domino effect. Conodonts were around too, and they underwent some evolutionary changes at this time. There were also other placoderms too, some of which were much smaller than their large cousin, who was the subject of this video. Both Rheolopus was one, and it was a bottom-dwelling species. Incisoscotum was also a Frasnian Age placoderm. Also in the Frasnian Age was when the first true forests were taking shape on land, just to give you an idea of what was going on out of the oceans. So, cool. Prequel to the forest should be announced any day now. Now then, on to the Feminian Age. Again, this was the last age of the Devonian. It lasted from right around 371.1 million years ago to 359 million years ago. During this time, cephalopods, specifically members of the ammonite genus, radically diversified and spread worldwide. On the opposite side of that wheel, though, there was the end of an extinction going on right now as the, as the Feminian Age began, and it was the tail end of what is known as the Frasnian Feminian extinction, or the Kelwasser event. It occurred 372 million years ago, and it happened right on the boundary of the two ages. 19% of families and 50% of genera were extinct by the end of the event. This age was capped off by the Hannenberg event, the Endivonian extinction, which we will talk about in a minute. Though, if they did crash in the Devonian in 65 and of the Cretaceous, they'd probably have the same bad luck and crash like three days before the extinction occurred. Anyway, this event is actually kind of mysterious, but we'll get to it in a minute. Dunkleosteus was still patrolling the oceans at this time, the Paleotethys and the Panthalassic Oceans, and it was still the apex predator of the ocean. Of course, it wasn't the only one, I'm, and I'm not just talking about sharks. There were some fascinating animals at this time, mostly still in the ocean, unless you're really into bugs, which was about all that was on land. The tetrapods hadn't quite made the jump fully to, fully to land yet, and wouldn't until the Carboniferous period. So one of the animals from this time was Hynera, a large predator lobe-finned fish with teeth. Really sharp teeth. I wouldn't want to be bitten by this guy. Unlike Dunkleosius, though, this was a freshwater fish, and it seems to have only existed in the Feminian Age. So, freshwater, saltwater, pick your poison. You couldn't get away from the predatory fish. Just be thankful you didn't have to deal with the buzzsaw shark yet. They didn't evolve just yet. One of the animals that did make the jump to land, because water was kind of not the place you wanted to be, was Hynerpotin, meaning creeping animal, and early four-limbed vertebrate that lived in the rivers and ponds of Pennsylvania for about two million years, going extinct around 363 million years ago. It only has one known species, but this is an example of an animal deciding, screw the water, I'm going for the high ground, Anakin. Basically, the water was so full of predators that some animals went for the alternative of safe land, where there were none. So yeah, the Feminian saw more animals making the jump out of the water, or getting ready to really make the jump onto land, or at least becoming semi-aquatic. As the Devonian closed out, that was the real big game changer that would define life going forward. Now then, while we're on the topic of the Feminian, let's use it to transition to the end of the Devonian itself, the time in which Dunkleosteus went extinct.
Dunkleosteus was among the animals to die out in the Devonian's own great dying. Though this mass extinction was nothing compared to the actual great dying of the Permian period. Basically, because Dunkleosteus was the apex predator and specialized to be at the top of the pyramid, when the pyramid came crashing down, the animals at the top tend to go with it in these kinds of events. The Devonian mass extinction affected reefs, marine invertebrates like brachiopods, trilobites, ammonites, conodonts, etc. Plankton were also hit hard, though the trilobites were fine. They were unkillable until the great dying. Vertebrates overall were not strongly affected by this event, though there was a diversity loss. Placoderms like Dunkleosteus, bye-bye. Tetrapods were fine, though. The extinction hit the ocean a lot harder than it did the land, but terrestrial plants did take a significant hit during this event too. 22% of families died out, and 75% of species died out. This was one of the big extinctions, up there with the Great Dying in the Permian and the KT extinction in the Cretaceous. Now you're probably wondering, what caused this extinction? This was one of the big ones, so what happened? Good question. It's not really well known, but it wasn't one cause. It wasn't like the KT where an asteroid hit the Grand Slam. Extinction events are kind of complicated. Multiple things contribute to it, but overall, we just have theories about what contributed to this one. We don't understand this one as well as some of the others, but we'll cover a few things here. One thing that did contribute to it was likely global cooling. The late Paleozoic Ice Age was kind of a thing. Some have theorized that this was the cause of the Hannenberg event. Volcanism is another thing which is theorized to have contributed to the extinction event. We know volcanoes can do damage to life because of that little event in the Permian called the Great Dying that thing that nearly ended life on Earth? Yeah, that was caused by volcanoes. Lots of volcanoes. Another theorized cause or contributing factor is an impact event. Though finding evidence for one is kind of hard to do. We, don't, we didn't even find the KT crater until the 1980s, and that was a much more recent impact event. However... In Sweden, there are the remains of an impact event which occurred when a meteorite struck the Earth in the late Devonian, and it has been proposed to have caused the aforementioned Kelvasser event. So it is very possible another could have hit, and we just can't find the impact site if it even still exists. We can't find any that coincide with this event at this time, but we can't rule it out. Moving on, we have a really cool theory here. The supernova theory. The scariest fish ever versus an exploding star. Who will win? This, this theory suggests exactly what you'd expect, that a nearby supernova explosion was the cause for the Hannenberg event. Cosmic rays from a nearby supernova would be capable of a severe degree of ozone depletion, which would have had catastrophic effects on life. The impact of a supernova could be tested on late Devonian fossils from this era. You could look for trace amounts of plutonium-244, but no published studies have been done to test this yet. For now, there is no direct evidence for this hypothesis or that a supernova caused this extinction event, but let's play devil's advocate. If volcanism was active on a large scale, that could have also had a serious effect on ozone levels like a supernova. So maybe both of these hit at the same time. The evidence is circumstantial, but it's interesting to think about. Either way, we know that the oceans suffered an anoxic event at this time which affected marine life. But the cause of this anoxic event is unknown for certain. Again, this isn't like the KT extinction where we know what caused it. In that case, it was an asteroid. In this case, it could have been, likely was, a number of things that contributed to it, and we just don't know. Having a single big cause for an extinction is rare, and for now, we can only theorize that multiple events caused this one.
Either way, by the end of the Endivonian extinction event, Dunkleosteus would be gone. And since that concludes the story of the subject of our video today, let's wrap up. That was Dunkleosteus, the scariest fish to ever swim the water of this planet. I couldn't cover everything about this animal. It was as complex of a creature as any that exists now. So there's more for you to discover. But I do hope you enjoyed. I introduced you to the history of its fossils being found, some of the ins and outs of the animal's biology, and the event which ultimately made it vanish from the Earth. It's widely accepted that Australopithecus afarensis are, to put it simply, the ancestors of Homo. So, Habilis, Ergaster, Erectus, Heidelbergensis, all the way to Sapiens. But what if I told you that 20 fossils were collected from a previously unknown hominid that kind of throws a wrench into all that? There is debate to this day about if this genus is actually our ancestor and that if they disprove whether or not we actually came from Afarensis. Today, I'm going to tell you the story of Aurorin, a mysterious early hominid from the Miocene Epoch, roughly 6 to 5.1 million years ago. And to call this topic the tip of the iceberg is the biggest understatement ever. Human evolution as a whole is just the tip of that iceberg. And this is just the tip of the, of the human evolution topic as well. There is so much cool knowledge, and I love it. If you were going to write a story with the goal of making it be as confusing as possible, you probably couldn't beat how confusing human evolution is. Every time we start to get a roadmap figured out, a new species is found, or an old species is no longer considered valid, and thus the dead end. So, while we have a lot of good ideas, there's still a lot that we just don't know. It seems that new hominids are found all the time, and Auroran is an example. A possible new addition to the tree of human evolution. Maybe. It also might not even be a close relative at all. <laughs> human evolution is a very complicated topic, and... This might be an early ancestor, or just something that branched off and died out. We'll get into that. But first, we need to know where it was discovered. Aurorin was discovered in Kenya, a country in eastern Africa. This region, eastern Africa, is a common area for early hominid fossils to be found. And it's clear that hominids have been spread heavily across this region for millions of years. They can be found across Africa, but Eastern Africa does seem to be a bit of a hotspot when, when compared to other regions. If you look at a map of where hominid fossils have been found, most are spread across the eastern half of the African continent. So it's no surprise that Auroran was found in this region too. Auroran itself is an incredibly ancient hominid. Now when I say ancient, I don't mean it existed in like the Cretaceous alongside the dinosaurs. Uh, no. No, we're about 50 million years too early in that case. If primate fossils were ever found that existed in the Cretaceous, that would be wild. Uh, but as far as we know, our ancestors back then were tiny little squirrels of their era, basically. Cute little things that could probably take a chunk out of your finger. No, by ancient I mean it existed possibly as far back as 6 million years ago. Named Original Man... It earns this by being one of the earliest species to exist in our direct family tree of bipedal apes. As I said a minute ago, original man was discovered in Kenya in the year 2000, though a molar fossil from 1974 is also thought to possibly come from this species, but this is not known for certain. 1974 was also the year a very famous early hominid fossil was found, the Australopithecus afarensis specimen Lucy. The Auroran genus itself is still officially recognized as being found in 2000. The Tuggan Hills of Barango County, Kenya, to be specific, is where the Auroran fossils were discovered by Bridget Sinet and Martin Pickford from the French National Museum of Natural History. 
After the fossils were found in 2000, they were kept at the Kipsarman Village Community Museum. But then the museum was closed. Afterward, the fossils have apparently been locked away in a secret bank vault in Nairobi, which is the capital of Kenya. Okay then, sounds like the plot of a conspiracy thriller. So Auroran is an obscure species, but the topic is interesting, and I have a soft spot for obscure and weird prehistoric animals. So, with, this, with the discovery covered, we'll move on to the description of Auroran, and after that we'll cover its status as a human ancestor, and then we'll cover the animals it shared its world with. Unlike my documentary, How a Ghost Ship Killed One-Third of Norway, this isn't a topic I can just follow a series of events to piece the story together with. This is going to be more of an overview. Sometimes you can get stories from fossils about what a specific individual went through or died from, but not in this case. So we have to try to piece everything there is to know about Aurora and together through very fragmentary remains. So, let's examine what Auroran might have looked like in life from what little we have to reconstruct the species with. We don't have many fossils of Auroran. The entire genus is represented by one classified species, kind of like Carnotaurus, actually. Though the difference there is the one skeleton of Carnotaurus we have is very well preserved. And as I said earlier, Auroran tugenensis is known from several fragments and pieces of at least five different individuals. The 20 fossils we have include several teeth and the posterior part of a mandible, a part of a jaw, which is in two pieces, a symphysis, femur of fragments, part of a humerus, which is the long arm bone that goes from your shoulder to elbow, digit bones from the hand, and a distal thumb phalanx. An isolated molar that may or may not belong to Auroran was also discovered in 1974, which I mentioned earlier. The name Auroran might have been used there first for this molar before the species was officially discovered in 2000. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I found some things that said Auroran was first described in 1975, but the species is like everywhere else described as being found in 2000. So I'm not totally sure about that, but that's my guess about what happened right there. Anyway, the fossils from this species range from 6.1 to 5.8 million years old. If the animal evolved before or lived until later is unknown, but most likely these dates represent the majority of its range. The teeth of this animal are interesting. They provide evidence that this might be the oldest member of the line that led to humans. The teeth of this species curiously resembles the teeth of modern humans way more than it resembles the teeth of Australopithecus afarensis. This is significant because afarensis is seen as our direct ancestor from 3 million years after Auroran. Yet Auroran is the more dubious one, even though it has the more human-like features. Now evolution doesn't go in a straight line, and heck, it sometimes goes backwards. So that doesn't prove or disprove anything. Auroran's teeth were smaller than Afarensis's, and they have an enamel, an enamel, excuse me, almost identical to ours. So, while on the topic of its teeth, they also seem to suggest a plant-based diet. Leaves, fruit, seeds, roots, nuts were all likely commonly found in the diet of Auroran, along with insects for protein. Auroran's femur also resembles a modern human femur much more closely than it resembles other apes from the era. The teeth and the femur are both part of the reason some argue that there is a direct link to modern humans with this genus. The few fossils we have also seem to indicate the species was bipedal, due to where the muscles and ligaments would have been attached. It's also possible that these species might have been able to create basic shelters However, this cannot be proven and only inferred as a possibility from the few fossils we have. Several apes can build shelter, so this is definitely a possibility, as building something simple to protect yourself isn't a very complicated task in and of itself. The species itself lived not in open grassland, but in evergreen forests, so the climbing ability mentioned before also makes sense, and this could have complemented its dietary habits. 
Fire usage is very unlikely though, and that's putting it lightly. Not just because of the plant-based diet, but even Australopithecus afarensis roughly 3 million or so years later didn't control fire. Fire was not something humans, the Homo genus, learned to harness until at the absolute earliest 2 million years ago. That itself is a controversial date though, as strong evidence for controlled fire does not come till later, around the time of Homo erectus, I believe. Either way, it can be more or less definitively stated that Auroran didn't control fire, or even use it. Even if we use the 2 million years ago estimation, we're still about 4 million years too early. So, no controlled fire for Auroran. You lose. Good day, sir. On screen is a really helpful timeline I found that shows when exactly it existed prior to controlled use of fire, as well as toolmaking confirmed by bipedalism, and even more advanced concepts such as art, which might have appeared around the same time as fire usage. As you can see, Auroran existed in a relatively small window of time well before controlled fire, and again, controlled fire was not something that became a concept until the Homo genus evolved. You can find this timeline in the description, and I'd recommend you check it out, as it is actually interactable. The size of Auroran itself was roughly that of a chimpanzee still, and despite likely being an early bipedal, as an early step away from apes and in the direction of humans, it was still able to climb trees and probably spent a lot of its time in trees. Now, we don't know exactly how this species, heck, how this genus, relates to humans. It's possible we evolved from it. It's possible it could be one of the very early ancestors, but we don't know. Australopithecus afarensis, which existed 2 to 3 million years later, as far as evolution goes, is still seen as the ancestor that really took the step towards humanity today. It's possible, though, that Auroran represents an early step in that direction. And we don't really know exactly where the steps that led to us began. We have an idea but we find these very ancient hominids that could be an ancestor or just offshoots that died out. Kind of like Paranthropus boisei, which is basically an offshoot that existed alongside early humans, but was far more... monkey still. I guess gorilla. They would be more gorilla than human. But... That is kind of the whole story of human evolution. If you try to plot out the map, you're not going to go in a straight road. There are so many branches and offshoots and subspecies to add to the main route that you're going to have a bad time driving it. So the question, though, is Auroran an ancestor we evolved from, or is it something else that just didn't lead anywhere? If it is a relative and ancestor to humanity, it would be very far back at the very base of the family tree of direct ancestors, at least. This would be a very primitive, very ape-like, and very early species that started walking down the evolutionary road that led to us, if it did. The few fossils we have are from, as I've said, at least five different individuals, which is good. Having more individuals is always good at getting a better understanding for the species as a whole. Still, that doesn't change the fact that this whole era basically has fragment fragmentary fossils of different and little understood hominids, and finding which one was the direct ancestor is the hard part. The best understood of the early hominids before Australopithecus afarensis would likely be Ardipithecus ramidus, which existed about 2 million years after Auroran. Since Auroran also appeared so soon after the branch off from chimpanzees occurred, it is likely that they appeared outwardly much more ape-like than they would resemble humans, probably still being covered in fur. This would be the case millions of years later in Australopithecus, and a more human shape probably only began to truly take form in Homo habilis, more than a million years after that. But remember, they did have some features that were more human-like, than Australopithecus. So who knows, honestly. 
like I said, evolution sometimes can go backwards. So at the very least, it's you can have some fun speculative ideas. But most likely, Auroran outwardly appeared very ape-like. I know, I'm starting to sound like I'm beating a dead horse, but the horse is already dead and fossilized, so who cares? Either way, there is not enough evidence at this time to support if this species is an early ancestor of humans, or if it is an offshoot that is not directly related or led to us. Experts remain divided on this topic. Either way, it lived at the point that the common ancestor between modern chimpanzees and humans split off, so the possibility of it being an early ancestor cannot be disproven at this time. The fact that some of its physical features, such as its teeth and femur, do resemble modern humans more than other apes from later on, can make for an argument that it is related to modern humans in some way. I've said in other documentaries that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And at this time, we don't have enough evidence to settle the matter either way. Maybe someday we'll know for certain if Auroran is the sought-after missing link between humans and great apes. The Auroran page on the Smithsonian website states this unanswered question best. Quote, is Auroran a direct ancestor to Homo sapiens? If so, does this make Australopithecus afarensis a side branch of our hominid family tree that eventually hit a dead end? This is probably the biggest question relating to this species that I'd love to see resolved. If it was found that afarensis wasn't a direct ancestor, that would be such a wild and fascinating development. As of right now, though, Australopithecus afarensis is still seen as a direct ancestor ancestor, and I don't think that will change at any point in the future. Though you never know. As I've mentioned, Auroran has those features that resemble modern humans far more closely than Australopithecus does. And Auroran existed nearly three million years earlier than Australopithecus did. So you've got to wonder, is our ancestor Auroran, and is Australopithecus the off-branch? Or is Australopithecus the ancestor, and Auroran the off-branch? Or is the answer somewhere in the middle? Are both our ancestors? Until we find more fossils, we just won't know. I've touched on a few species of hominids here and there, so in this next section, I'm going to take a little time to talk about some of the other early hominid species that existed instead of just focusing on Auroran. Not necessarily ones that existed alongside Auroran either, just some other early species in general. I'm not going to cover any of the extinct Homo species here. I'll reference some as needed, but those might get entire videos dedicated to them in the future. I'll be covering Australopithecus afarensis and very, uh, various other hominids from various points in time in this section, mostly to give a wider picture about what other species existed throughout history, before and after Auroran. They're all part of the same puzzle, after all. And while I can't go through them all, I'll, I'll cover some that I found notable. I want to talk about some of the others outside of Auroran as well, because there's just not that much on Auroran. And I want to share some of these other amazing animals with you and encourage you to learn about them. Especially since there's so little info on some of these, I could make an entire video, video about them. Okay, let's get to it. First, Australopithecus afarensis. At this time, it is still seen as the species we would evolve from. Afarensis is one of the earliest hominids, which is almost unanimously agreed upon by paleoanthropologists as being a direct ancestor to us. It's the earlier ones like Auroran, where the debate on which is the, which is the ancestor becomes more intense. Maybe it'll change in the future as we come to understand other species more, but as of right now, Afarensis is still seen as our direct ancestor. I mentioned earlier that if Auroran was found to be an ancestor to us, it might mean that Afarensis was an offshoot. But as of right now, that is just a theory, and a very controversial one. So anyway, what was Australopithecus Afarensis? Existing in East Africa from 3.9 to 2.9 million years ago during the Pliocene Epoch, 
The species was first described in 1978, though fossils had been found earlier as far back as the 1930s. As I mentioned a while ago, Lucy, also known as AL288-1, was a female afarensis specimen that stood a little over three feet tall and whose fossilized remains made up roughly 40% of her whole body. Named after the song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, she was determined to be 3.2 million years old. The species has arm and leg bones similar to apes like gorillas and orangutans, but was still bipedal, though likely less efficient at walking upright than humans are. The species had a tall face and robust jawbone. Their jaw, in fact, extended outward, a trait known as prognathism. Stone tools have been associated with the species as well, indicating they consumed at least some meat in their diet, though they were not strict carnivores. Like us, they were omnivorous. Afarensis stood between three to four feet tall on average, with males and females exhibiting sexual dimorphism. And they likely fell prey to the major predators living in Africa at this time, including various big cats and prehistoric hyenas. Due to the sexual dimorphism the species exhibits, it is likely they existed in a polygonous society, like many modern apes do today. Afarensis displays lower sexual dimorphism than other species, and smaller teeth than other primates, and some have used this fact to argue that the species might have actually existed in a monogamous society. Either cannot be proven for certain though, and today scientists still make a case for both. Afarensis has long been seen as the direct ancestor to modern humans. They did not seem to have a preferred habitat. Their fossils indicate they inhabited a wide range of areas with different conditions grasslands, woodlands, river or lakeside forests, and shrublands were all fair game. I touched on their diet a minute ago, but let me bring it back up now. Their diets vary depending on the environment they lived in. Forest-dwelling afarensis preferred forest plants, and grassland-dwelling afarensis preferred common savanna plants. The evidence of stone tools being used to butcher meat come from a young goat-sized bovid femur, and a cow-sized hoofed animal that had possible cut marks on its ribcage. Both are circumstantial and, as of this time, have not been proven either way to be from stone tools or not. If they were determined to be so, they would be the oldest known evidence of tool usage in the fossil record. Afarensis would go extinct 2.9 million years ago, but the Australopithecus as a genus would last until around 1.9 million years ago. And since the earliest known homo specimen, LD350-1, existed 2.8 million years ago, with Homo habilis following 2.3 million years ago, this means human beings for a time coexisted with the Australopithecus genus, which is fascinating to think about. You gotta wonder how the two interacted. And since the earliest Homo species appeared so soon after Afarensis went extinct, you can even wonder if humans didn't coexist with Afarensis for however brief a time. A fascinating idea that we might not ever have the answer to. There is no evidence for it, but it is a fascinating idea to speculate about. Next, let's take a look at Auranopithecus. This is a far more ancient hominid than either Australopithecus or Auroran. Living in Greece for nearly a million years, from 9.6 to 8.7 million years ago. This hominid is thought to be one of, if not the last, common ancestors between humans, chimpanzees, or gorillas. This was a large and well-built hominid, likely being as large as a female gorilla today. There is no evidence that this genus, which has two known species, was bipedal as far as I can find. One thing I do feel the need to point out is that not every ape that is a hominid is necessarily related to humans, as the term applies to all great apes. And there are eight species still extant, and they consist of humans, gorillas, chimps, and orangutans. We all share a common ancestor or, an, an, or ancestors, which branched off into different family lines with time. Hominins, meanwhile, are the direct family tree humans evolved from. Back to Auranopithecus, the name of this animal means celestial ape, and the genus is represented by two known species. There isn't much information on this species, but a recent, as in 2017, 
study determined that out of the hominid species living in Greece at this time, this one was more related to other apes than humans. Another hominid living in the area that is seen to be more closely related to humans than Aranapithecus is Graciapithecus, which I will have a segment de dedicated to in a little bit. There's not much more really of note to say about this genus. We haven't found enough fossils to have a clear picture of them yet. And the genus was only discovered in 2007, so it's also still relatively a, a new one. Maybe in the future we will get a better idea, but for now, the mind has to wander, and we have to work with what few fossils we have to understand what no doubt was a complex animal in its own right. Until we learn more, I'm going to leave this one here and move on to the next topic. A species that lived after Auroran was gone was Ardipithecus. This is an extinct genus of hominids that lived in Ethiopia during the early Pliocene, first appearing around 5.6 million years ago and having species living for around a million years afterwards before the last would die out. This species was once seen as one of humanity's earliest ancestors after our common ancestor diverged from chimpanzees. This is now a matter of debate, as is if this is even a hominid, but since this hasn't been decided either way just yet. I decided to include this animal in this section of the video. This hominid, Ardipithecus ramidus, a member of the African hominid subfamily, lived around 4.4 million years ago. And fossil specimens have been found in Eastern Africa, with all known fossils of this genus coming from Ethiopia. It is agreed that this species did not represent the most recent ancestor between humans and chimpanzees, as it existed well after the most common ancestor for both. An interesting fact is that the fossils of this species have led some scientists to question if the origin of language might not have begun around this time, or at the very least begun earlier than what was once thought, as it had a significant vocal ability. This is highly speculative, but interesting to think about. If you look at a family tree of hominids, you'll see that even though it was once thought as such, Ardipithecus is not a direct ancestor to humans. Rather, we both share a common ancestor, and our two lineages branched very early on. This species would be more of a distant cousin to us rather than a direct evolutionary relative. Of course, with new discoveries comes new theories, and maybe one day this idea will change. For right now, though, you can see the accepted evolutionary tree shows them as an offshoot from us, branching off early on from a shared evolutionary ancestor. You know that Simpsons meme, I just think they're neat? That's basically my stance on this one. I wasn't originally going to cover it, but I just think it's neat, so here we are. When I watched Walking with Cavemen for the first time, I know, horribly outdated documentary, but it's still entertaining, just like Walking with Dinosaurs, I was kind of enamored with Boise Eye, and I even gave it a cameo in my book. So Boise Eye is believed to have been a specialist of its day, adapted for a specific lifestyle. In fact, this likely contributed to its extinction if you adapt to live in a specific ecosystem, when that ecosystem inevitably changes, you just can't change with it. Animals that don't live in a specific niche always adapt, while those that depend on specific things tend to vanish in extinctions. Now. Sometimes this species is called Australopithecus boisei. The reason is that some consider Paranthropus to be an outdated grouping. But I don't think there is a firm stance either way on that one. Either way, this species also existed well after Auroran was gone, living from roughly 2.5 to 1.15 million years ago. All specimens of this species, and Paranthropus as a whole, have been found across a wide range of East Africa. After being discovered, they were referred to by some as Nutcracker Man due to its large teeth and jaw giving it resemblance to a vintage nutcracker. The diet of this species likely consisted of abrasive plants, roots, or other storage organs for plants, nuts, and other hard foods. It is theorized that, based on the behaviors from modern chimps and baboons, that this species probably forged for food during the cool morning hours rather than during the heat of the day. Interestingly, some stone tools have been found with specimens of the species. 
Stone tools as a whole is not an advanced concept. Many apes today use stone tools, but if this species created them, or if early Homo species created them and Boisei then found and used them, is unknown. It was thought they did originally, but today Homo habilis is seen as the more likely creator of the tools. This species also exhi exhibits circumstantial evidence of sexual dimorphism. However, this is based on only one specimen and cannot be confirmed for certain. It is a bit of speculative evolution that Walking with Caveman actually worked into its program over two decades ago, in the second episode if you're curious. Speaking of Walking with Caveman, you remember from earlier I mentioned that Boisei is thought to have gone extinct because it was a specialist in its environment and couldn't adapt to live in a new one when the environment changed? Well, the show has one line that I really like, which describes exactly that. The trouble with being a specialist is that you end up getting left behind. This extinct species of hominid lived in the Miocene a little over 7 million years ago. That's only around 59 million years after, that, after the dinosaurs went extinct. They lived in, interestingly, Athens, Greece. Originally known from only a lower jawbone, still armed with a single tooth, found in 1944, more fossils of the species were later found in Bulgaria. I found this interesting, as it shows hominids might have left Africa well before early Homo species like Erectus did. I found this fascinating, since I'd never heard of hominids leaving Africa until humans migrated out of it, and this was what made me decide to cover this hominid. However, it also supports a theory that hominids might have evolved outside of Africa itself. Remember, the Oranopithecus also lived outside of Africa around a million years earlier. I'll get into a little more detail about this theory in just a moment. I first want to cover a few more details about Greesopithecus. If I pronounced that wrong, I am sorry. I could not find a consistent way to pronounce this one's name. The fossils we have of this species are in such a poor state that this animal has been known as, quote, the most poorly known European Miocene hominin. The original site the first fossils were found in cannot be re-examined for more, as a swimming pool was built over it in the mid-1980s. Despite that, and despite the poor state of the few fossils we do have, we know a few things about them. In 2017, an analytical study done by paleontologists determined that this might very well be the oldest hominid meaning it would be the oldest direct human ancestor after we div diverged off from the line that led to chimpanzees. The 2017 study determined that this species shares ancestry with modern humans, not chimpanzees. The study also suggested that hominid origins might not be from Africa, but rather the Mediterranean region. Just like Auroran, this really throws a wrench into a lot of our current theories of human evolution, and ideas will have to be reworked, but that's just how science works. The theory basically says descendants of this early hominid would migrate into Africa and humans would evolve from there before we would migrate back out. This is not universally accepted by any means, and many scientists dispute this theory. Though the fact hominids existed outside of Africa this early on does offer some evidence to support the idea. This hominid was much older than the oldest known hominid fossils found in Africa, Silanthropus, but it is not necessarily an ancestor to that genus. Overall, we don't know much about this species. We only know that it was a hominid due to its teeth, and hopefully we will one day find more fossils of it and learn its exact place in our evolutionary history, what it evolved into, and what it even looked like. Until then, though, we have to work with what we have found. Out of all the early hominids we have covered here, I think this one might be the most interesting in my opinion, and is the one that I hope we learn more about in the future. I hope more fossils are found someday, and maybe we'll get lucky and find a very well-preserved specimen somewhere. Only time will tell. The world that Auroran lived in was both familiar to what we'd see today, but it was also alien to what we'd see today. Some of the other animals that existed alongside Auroran will just say 6 million years for a nice round number, which puts us in the tertiary period. I know that's not the formal name for the era, but it's the one I grew up with, so that's what I'm going to call it. Included predatory sperm whale species in the oceans, 
Familiar animals to us also existed by this time, including bison, horses, antelope species, and the big cat species, Paranthropa... A species name I can't pronounce, here it is on screen. This is the oldest of the big cat species, and it very likely preyed on auroran and other early hominids. Salanthropus was another early, slightly older hominid that existed during the time auroran did. And other animals that existed at this time included various dinotherium species. Dinotherium was a very large elephant-like species with tusks growing out of its lower jaw. They lived in Africa and as far north as Europe. Walking with beasts shows the animal as being very aggressive, though personally I'm not sure how accurate that portrayal is. I would imagine they acted very similar to modern elephants, though, which can be very aggressive. Dinotherium most likely died out when the forest habitat vanished and turned into grasslands near the end of the tertiary. Another animal that lived at this time was... Amabelin. Something that somehow manages to look both familiar and alien at the same time. I'm not kidding. Look it up. <laughs> look it up. I'll let that one be a surprise for you. You can look that one up and uh, have a shock. But it's, it's seriously, it's impressive how it manages to do both. And it kind of reminds me of how Adestis and members of that whole family managed to look both familiar and bizarre and alien at the same time. And Silotherium also existed at this time and likely lived alongside Auroran. The two coexisted for Auroran's entire existence. However, if they ever encountered each other, I don't know, but it's possible they did. They both lived in Kenya at the same time. Another animal that may have been a threat to Auroran was Dinopithecus. Now, this is purely speculative on my part, but Dinopithecus first appears in the fossil record only a relatively short time after Auroran vanishes. Only a few hundred thousand years. So there's a chance the two may have overlapped for a very brief time, but due to our lack of fossils for both, we don't have any evidence to say that they did. Again, there's no actual evidence Auroran and Dinopithecus lived at the same time. But if Auroran actually lasted a little bit longer than we think now, or Dinopithecus evolved just a little sooner than we think it did, then it's a possibility. And since both species have so few fossils between them to gather information from, I wouldn't say it's impossible that they coexisted briefly. But as of right now, there's no evidence to support them coexisting. This is just a little bit of speculation I had, and it's a fun idea to entertain. But remember, purely speculation. Now, terror birds did exist at the time Auroran did, but would not have encountered early hominids, which is fortunate for our ancestors, as they had enough major predators in their world without the reincarnation of the dinosaurs also breeding down their necks. Another apex predator that existed at the same time as Auroran was Megalodon. Look, look, I'm gonna level with you for just a second here. Megalodon is cool, but it's just a big shark. It's probably the most overhyped animal in prehistory outside of something like the T-Rex. It's a shark, not a goliath or a kaiju or a savage sea monster. It is just a shark, and it's extinct. Don't try to tell me it's still alive. It's not. We'd know. Trust me, we'd know. And if you want to use the argument, oh, it evolved to live differently, well, then it wouldn't be a megalodon anymore. I get so sick of those channels on YouTube spreading so much misinformation that it's still alive. Megalodon was almost at the end of its heyday six million years ago. It didn't have much time left at this point. And in my opinion, Megalodon isn't even the coolest or the scariest prehistoric shark or shark-like fish. Call me when you discover the Adestus. I'd honestly rather see one of those in life over the Megalodon. Anyway, I suppose there is a small possibility a Megalodon could have eaten an Auroran at some point, like with Encylotherium, Auroran did coexist with the Megalodon for its entire existence. So, wouldn't that be a way to go? We haven't found Auroran fossils exactly on the coast, but it's always a possibility the species was spread out enough that some individuals could have ended up in the region. Sorry about the little side tangent there. I just wanted to make that point clear. Megalodon is extinct. It would be very cool if it still existed, but when you're approaching science, you have to do it objectively and not let your personal feelings or wishes get in the way. 
I say something very similar in my Loch Ness Monster documentary. In that video, I said it would be very cool if plesiosaurs still existed today, but they don't. Anyway, like terror birds, Megalodon probably didn't encounter Auroran, but this one is at least more likely to have had a chance of occurring. It would just take one Auroran going for a swim in the shallow water off the coast at the right time. And since both coexisted for over a million years, even a low probability event has a chance of having occurred. I'd pay to see a movie about a troop of early hominids being menaced by a megalodon if it was done well. So, that should give you a small idea of some of the animals that existed or could have existed at this time. You know, that was the very tip of a very, fasc of a very fascinating iceberg, but I can't cover everything. But again, it was a world both familiar and alien at the same time. You had animals basically living exactly as they did today. Like I said, antelopes, and you had animals that are totally extinct now, like Ensilotherium. And you had giant versions of some animals we have today, like Megalodon and maybe Dinopithecus. What a fascinating period in prehistory that would have been to be alive in. Dangerous, but it honestly would be kind of cool. Man, isn't paleontology wild? Today, in my second paleo mini-documentary, I'm going to share with you everything you need to know about the crocodile that essentially became a duck. You all know me. I love hybrids. The more bizarre and creative looking, the better. Heck, version 2, the antagonist of my original post-apocalyptic audio story and soon-to-be-published novella, is a hybrid dinosaur with the teeth and tooth structure of the Adestus and the armor of a Dunkleosteus. But unlike version 2, this crocodile is not a fictional hybrid. It looks like one, but it's not. This is a real crocodile that evolved a snout which heavily resembles a duck's bill. There are a lot of weird prehistoric crocodiles. There's a lot of weird prehistoric animals in general when compared to animals that exist today. But this might be the winner of that contest, at least when it comes to crocodiles. Thankfully, this animal isn't really a mystery. We have a good understanding of why it evolved to look the way it did. Now, if you want a real head-scratcher when it comes to bizarre extinct animals, look up the Waukesha butterfly animal and try to solve that mystery. This, however, isn't a mysterious animal that we don't even have a name for. It's just a crocodile with a duck face. Okay, that's enough hype. Let's get to it. Anatosuchus itself is an extinct genus of Notasuchii crocodilimorph. Notasuchii, a suborder itself, existed from the Jurassic to the Cretaceous. And crocodilomorph is part of the Pseudosuchian archosaurs, which includes crocodiles today and their extinct relatives. Now, I know that that was a lot of names and a lot of families to keep track of. I said in my video on Aurora and how complicated human evolution was, and this is just as convoluted of a roadmap as well. Prehistoric crocodiles branched off into a lot of different groups and families, and many took unique forms and had a very diverse amount of lifestyles, each living in its own specific niche. Anatosuchus is a very good example of a crocodile evolving a specific trait to live a specific lifestyle. Anatosuchus gets its duck comparison because of the very duck-like snout and jaw on its face, and its name literally means duck crocodile. The comparison comes from the fact that the animal's snout is very similar to a duck's bill. It lived in the Cretaceous and likely used its peculiar snout to root and sift for prey in the shallow water along streams and rivers. This itself is not a very large animal, especially if you compare it to some crocodiles from today and especially to some from back then. This was definitely not a dinosaur eater. The prey it ate were probably small fish or semi-aquatic animals. It was less than a meter long, only being 70 centimeters in length. This animal's ribs are straight on the atlas and the axis vertebrate, but the ones on the cervical vertebrae are short and the dorsal ribs bend down towards the belly. 
Unlike modern crocodiles, this animal doesn't have the sprawled legs they do, but rather it stands upright. This means it was mostly a terrestrial animal, though I'm sure it could swim as well, especially if it did sift around and hunt in shallow water for small prey animals, putting its duck-like snout to use like a shovel. I picture this animal using its snout kind of like a shovel on the water, pushing around rocks in the bottom of shallow Cretaceous streams. The shoulder blade, known as the scapulae, are broad, but do not flare very widely at the distal end of the blade, which is actually tucked underneath the ostroderms. Ostroderm, the bony deposits forming scales, appear to have been present in the dorsal of this animal, indicating it likely had scales that resembled modern crocodiles. The humeri, the long bone in the arm that runs to the elbow from the shoulder, are very slender and have straight shafts. From these, it is theorized the legs were able to be held quite straight. The squamosal, a skull bone found in most reptiles, birds, and amphibians, were on the back and the top of a Natasuchus's skull. They are triradiate, which means they have three rays or radiating branches. These have slender anterior processes, which contact the postorbitals, which is the area behind the eye socket and then offset posterior processes, which then dip down into the brain case. I hope some of you are biologists, because I did not understand all of that. That was a lot of scientific terms for a lot of very specific things. But I get the general picture. I do. I get the general picture. For such a little crocodile, there's so much going on with it. And I love that. I love that we are able to know so much about it, especially since it's such a small animal. And there are far bigger ones that we have way less of when it comes to remains. You know, the fact that we were able to get lucky enough to know this much about Anatosuchus is just incredible. And again, the fact the fossils we have are in such a good state, and we can learn basically about every single bone inside of it, it's amazing. So even though I don't fully grasp everything when it comes to how each specific bone or formation or the biology of the animal... I've said it before, I'm educated in homeland security, uh, not paleontology. I love paleontology, um, but I'm not an expert. I don't pretend to be, but that's also not an excuse to get information wrong. So I always make sure to double check everything. And all the information and all those terms were right, I just don't fully grasp all of them. But that's okay. You know, we'll cover some crocodiles in a little bit that we're not this lucky with, and we can't get this clear of a picture of. So I just wanted to take a moment to say how amazing it is that we are able to know so much about our little duck crocodile here. All right, for now, though, let's shift back to topic, and we'll get to the paleobiology of Anatosuchus. Now, to be fair, to call a prehistoric animal odd is a bit unfair. Sure, some of them might look strange from our perspective, but that's because we view the world from how the world is today, while they evolved to look the way they did to fit the world at their time. That was normal for them. If they were to look at us and not eat us, they would probably think that we were the ones who were odd-looking. As I mentioned, this animal is thought to have had a diet consisting of small semi-aquatic animals, and it likely caught them by wading into the water like a heron does today. Now, let's examine the skull and the jaws themselves. The lower jaw is U-shaped, and it has 21 teeth on each side. Anatosuchus's teeth have subconical crowns which curve inward towards the center of the crocodile's mouth. Most of its teeth were small, relative to its body, and most don't have much wear. Interestingly, this indicates that they weren't used very much when compared to some other crocodiles. Natasuchus's largest teeth were found at the corner of its skull. And Natasuchus also had a narrow alveolar margin, which is the thickened ridge of bone where the tooth sockets are, and combined with the rest of the skull structure, which for such a small crocodile is honestly pretty complex, created a square-shaped head. 
It's great that the skull, in particular, is so well preserved, as you can really understand a lot of key things about this animal and any animal when you get lucky enough for that. The premaxilla are flat and broad, and they form a straight line across the front of the duck snout of the Natasuchus. Each holds six recurved teeth which point backwards towards the back of the mouth. The maxillae, the upper fixed bone of the jaw and vertebrates, each held 19 small recurved teeth, and it was the largest and most expensive bone in the skull. Speaking of the skull, if we compare juvenile and adult specimens, the skull seems to develop its broad, flattened shape as the animal grows older. It also has long nasal bones. I know I keep saying this animal had an exact duck bill, and that's not exactly true. The snout just heavily, heavily resembled a modern duck bill, but it's obviously not, as ducks wouldn't evolve for several million years yet. Overall, the fossils of this animal that we have are very well preserved for the most part. I mentioned this earlier. And even the brain case of this animal is very well preserved. Here we go again with the complex paleobiology that I don't understand all that well. <laughs> On each side of the skull, there are three eustachian formina, the auditory tube of the inner ear. Anatosuchus also has a pair of crests which run between the quadrate and the petragoid on each lateral side of the brain case. So, even though the fossils we have of this animal are limited, which is not an unusual thing at all in paleontology, we can still learn a lot about Anatosuchus. I said in my Auroran video that I hope one day we find a skull of one so that we can learn a great more deal about it than we could with just fragments of arms and jaws. In this case, it's the opposite. Out of the fossils we have, the skull is among them, but large parts of the body are missing. Though we do have the dorsal of the animal, and along with a few other bones from one specimen, which, like the skull, are preserved very well with a lot of detail and information that can be learned, parts are still missing. And maybe one day, we'll have the missing bits of both. One other part that we have is a very well-preserved foot, or hand. The forehands of this crocodile are very large relative to its size. There are four digits on each hand, with each having six joints in them. They also have long unguals, which are the claws at the end of each toe. We don't know exactly why or what benefit the animal got from this feature, but the claws on Anatosuchus were very strongly arched. It's just a little detail to make note of. Again, we don't know the exact reason why. The world Anatosuchus lived in was not like our world today. The plants and animals of Earth at the time were very different. The temperatures during the point of the early Cretaceous Anatosuchus lived in were generally warm. It was a warm time. Though a bit of a cold snap is believed, or at least theorized, to have occurred around the around the epitian alban boundary. The Epidian, the last age Anatosuchus is thought to have existed in, was characterized by dramatic tectonic, oceanographic, and climate, and biotic changes. And its record is punctuated by oceanic anoxic events, which are basically periods of widespread marine anoxia during which large amounts of organic carbon were buried on the ocean floor under oxygen-deficient bottom waters. In this case, an anoxic event is when the ocean loses a lot of its oxygen, and this can be devastating for marine ecosystems. Similar events have led to mass extinctions in the past. I believe one of the most popular theories about the Ordovician mass extinction is that it was a devastating anoxic event in the ocean. Though these events in the Cretaceous might have had an effect on terrestrial animals to an extent, Anatosuchus was probably unaffected, as its fossils are from the middle of Africa, basically, far from the oceans. However, that doesn't mean that Anatosuchus had an easy life or lived in some lush paradise free from dangers. This little guy existed alongside dinosaurs so massive that they probably wouldn't even notice if they stepped on it. 
It also would no doubt have been prey for some of the animals that existed. I could see a dromaeosaur of some kind thinking a duck croc would look perfectly snack-sized, though I'm not 100% sure if dromaeosaurs existed in Africa during the Cretaceous. I think there's sparse evidence for them existing there in the Jurassic, but I'm not sure about the Cretaceous. It, either way, my point is that this crocodile was so small, I could see it being viewed as a tasty snack for some of the smaller carnivores. The dinosaurs Anatosuchus shared its world with were the... Aranosaurus, Nigersaurus, and maybe Lurdosaurus. One other dinosaur that Anatosuchus might have also coexisted with, and probably would have been in the vicinity of regularly given its likely aquatic animal-based diet, was Suchomimus, the crocodile mimic, a personal favorite dinosaur of mine. Niger itself was no stranger to dinosaurs being home to large sauropods like Jobaria, and carnivorous theropods like Afrovenator in the Jurassic period, millions of years prior, and dinosaurs would live in the country until the end of the Cretaceous period. Oranosaurus nigersaurus, also known as the dinosaur with 500 teeth, by the way, and Lurdosaurus were all herbivorous animals, and likely weren't much of a threat to Anatosuchus. At the most, they might have accidentally stepped on it if one of them didn't move out of their way when they came down to the riverside for a drink. I guess Suchomimus likely wasn't a big threat to Anatosuchus either. Anatosuchus was so small that it likely wouldn't have been worth the effort to chase one down. Though maybe it was hunted by juvenile Suchomimus. I could see it being a decent meal for one when they weren't much larger than a hatchling. Now that's a speculative idea on my part, but it's one that I could definitely see being possible at least. The fossils of Anatosuchus were found by a team of paleontologists led by the American Paul Serena in 2003, and they were discovered in Gadufewa, Niger, a country in north-central Africa. The animal's full name, Anatosuchus minor, is a reference to the small size of the animal. The holotype material of the species that was found included a nearly complete skull with an articulated jaw, which you would have seen on screen earlier in the video. It's Superorder was determined to be of Crocodilimorpha, and the suborder is Nodosuchia. As I also mentioned earlier, it was determined that the animal lived in the early Cretaceous, from either the late Epidian or the early Albion periods, probably putting it somewhere around 113 million years old. Based on other fossils we have found, we believe the closest relative to this animal existed on Madagascar. In terms of evolution and relation to modern crocodiles and ducks, the most recent common ancestor between the two is the base of the Archosauria clade, which was probably superficially similar to modern crocodiles. We don't have any fossils of this ancestor, but we have some that exist close to when it would have existed. It's interesting, though, that a crocodile would try out the duckbill look and use it millions of years before the birds ever did. I hope one day more fossils of this animal are found. It's a very interesting crocodile, and for now, all we have are the skull, jaw, and a few other bits, some of which you saw on screen earlier. Hopefully, one day we will find a nearly intact specimen to get a better understanding of the animal, especially since right now we can only infer so much information about it, and what we have is rather limited. I know we can get a lot from what we have, but it's still a long way from having a complete picture of the animal. But this is also why I, the point, this is the point of these current um, paleo documentaries. I want to give the spotlight to these obscure and lesser known to the masses species. And I want to give them the spotlight and to show people more about these incredible animals. Prehistoric crocodiles are honestly quite the topic. There's so many different species and genus and forms they evolved into. Some are kind of cute. You know, one was doing its best to imitate an armadillo before armadillos ever evolved. And some are nightmare fuel and nothing else. Like butcher crocodiles. That's some scary stuff. And heck, one of the largest predators of the Cenozoic, which is the current era of Earth, and it started right after the dinosaurs went extinct and the Cretaceous mass extinction, was a crocodile. 
Barina Suchis was perhaps the biggest predator of this whole era. Move aside grizzly and polar bears, this thing would have maybe eaten them. Maybe. Might have tried. If it was still around today, it would probably actively hunt humans like polar bears and saltwater crocodiles do. I'm going to keep this section short, um, but I'm going to talk about five different genus. And I want to give you an idea of just how different and diverse prehistoric crocodiles were to show the true biodiversity of each of, uh, of just them as a whole, you know. There are so many, and so many evolved to live in totally different environments, lives, and lifestyles. So I'm going to keep the descriptions brief, and I would actually recommend Paleoanalysis' two-part video series on land crocs for in-depth in some of these animals. Uh, he goes very in-depth in the history of prehistoric land crocodiles, and they were both very great videos. This section, exploring different members of the crocodile family, won't be half the video like it was in the Auroran one. I'm going to keep these brief and just cover the basics so you get an idea of each one. Let's start with Quincana fortorostrum. Quincana has a terrifying set of jaws and a terrifying size to go with that. It's quite the package. Like, for real. Look at this thing. Would you be surprised if I told you it lived in Australia? This genus inhabited Australia from 28 million years ago to as recently as 10,000 years ago. When Fortisorum was discovered, the partial skull was described as of unusual form because of the higher snout if compared to extant crocodiles. Lyle Lyle here was a serious predator, standing nearly as tall as a 5 foot 9 human. In fact, it is thought to have been the top predator of Pleistocene Australia, along with the giant monitor lizard Megalina and the modern saltwater crocodile. I guess we know which one won out in the long term, but these guys would have been the three lizards of the apocalypse in the eyes of the mammals and other prey animals they ate. The teeth of this animal and the Quincana genus were very similar to modern extant crocodiles, though some of the teeth were serrated. Fortisorum also had a deeper infraorbital bar, the lower margin of the eye socket, than modern crocodiles do. This genus was, at one time, thought to be entirely a terrestrial type of crocodile. This is due to the amount of remains that have been found in caves. The fact that they had a flattened tail, and their hoof-like ungules. However, today it is thought that they were actually semi-aquatic because many specimens have been found near waterways. Man, th this guy really reminds me of the character version 2 for my book right now. Holy shit. Nature can be really scary. This semi-aquatic idea is still a matter of debate, and no consensus has been reached. Okay, as much as I'd love to keep talking about this genus, they are very cool. I'm going to keep these sections short. Again, I just want to give you an idea of the sheer diversity among prehistoric crocodiles. So many lived completely differently, evolved to look completely differently, and heck, some weren't even carnivores anymore. So, let's move on to the next one. I encourage you to research any of these more in your own time. There is a lot of really cool information to find. Next is Barina Suchis. A crocodile from your nightmare because it was tall enough to look you in the eye. Or, if you're a shorter individual, look down at you. As I mentioned, this might have been one of the largest land-based predators in the t entire Cenozoic era. Bigger than a polar bear and a grizzly bear. Yeah, this, this guy isn't one of the pug-nosed herbivorous crocodiles of prehistory. This is one of the most nightmarish carnivor carnivorous ones of prehistory. This animal lived during the mid-Eocene, around 40 to 45 million years ago, until the Miocene, just under 12 million years ago. Bar Barina Suchis is a member of the extinct genus Sebexid mesocrocodilian. What fossils we have are all found in middle Miocene age rocks in Peru, and the middle Miocene age rocks in Venezuela. When it was initially described in 2007, it was given the full scientific name Barinosuchus arviloi, with arviloi being the only species to represent the Barinosuchus genus at this time. Now, the fossils we have of Barinosuchus are fragmentary, but what we have consists of skulls. 
No fossils past the skull have been found at this time. The fossils we have, though, can give us a lot of information, especially when it comes to the size of this animal. The preserved parts of the skull are 70 centimeters in length, and the entire length of Anatosuchus, if you remember, was 70 centimeters. With the entire skull of this animal believed to be over three, maybe even close to four feet long, and consists of teeth very similar to the theropod dinosaurs of a million years earlier, with its teeth very well preserved and still sticking out of the upper jaw in some fossils. We also estimate the animal, animal to be 20 to 25 feet long. We have some, this thing is just becoming more nightmarish the more I read. I've seen some estimates that put this at crocodile at a staggering 35 feet long. Oh my gosh. This thing is just becoming more nightmarish as I read about it. A crocodile that long that stands tall enough to look you in the eye. That's scary. That nature is very really scary. That's horror movie stuff. Why do these keep reminding me of version 2? You, prob you probably won't be surprised to learn that this is the largest known septicid. The weight of this carnivore we can only guess. However, from what fossils we have, and what we can infer from related species that we have more complete specimens of, we can calculate an estimated weight. And it's this estimated weight, even with a margin of error as high as 50%, that we believe it would be the largest terrestrial carnivore to ever exist in the Cenozoic, beating out any mammal predators for the last 66 million years. The paleobiology of this animal is a little hard to fully work out with how, how few fossils we have, but we know that this is a fully terrestrial crocodile and undeniably a carnivore. Most probably the top carnivore in its environment. I don't know if it would have coexisted with terror birds. I know they existed in South America as well. But if it did, I'd say the four Sorakids would probably have been Barina Suchis' greatest competition. Let's move on from a nightmare crocodile before I lose my mind uh, to something that you won't expect for a crocodile. You've met duck croc, now let's meet armadillo croc. Armadillo suchus. You know how sometimes in animated movies set in prehistoric times, they'll just make random animals up by mixing different ones together? That's what this guy looks like. Like some... Like, someone just mixed an armadillo up with a crocodile. So what was this oddball crocodile all about? This fellow existed in the late Campanian to the early Maastrichtian periods of the late Cretaceous. The Maastrichtian is actually the last age of the Cretaceous before the KT extinction, 65 to 66 million years ago. This crocodile is believed to have been fully terrestrial due to its long legs, which are similar to other fully terrestrial crocodiles, and it was possibly even a burrower as well, like a meerkat. Because I love meerkats, I'm going to refer to Armadillo Suchus as Flower from now on, if you know, you know. Flower was found in Brazil, and dated to have existed sometime around 70 million years ago. Directly behind her skull, Flower had a thick layer of armor protecting her neck and back. Again, why... Are these crocodiles reminding me of version 2? At least he got armor from a Dunkleosteus, so it's not exactly the same. At least this is a cute crocodile as well. Finally, something cute instead of nightmare-inducing. On flower, the ostroderms, normal to crocodilimorph, are fused together to create a rigid shield of hexagonal plates, referred to, uh, referred to by researchers as the cervical shield. This shield then loosely linked seven bands of armor together that could move a little. Overall, this makes researchers think that Flower could tuck her legs up for protection, similar to some modern armadillos. However, they do not think she was able to fully roll up. Moving down to the tail, the armor researchers found here was typical for what we would usually expect to see on a crocodile. Okay, I'm done referring to her as Flower. We'll go back to its actual name. Armadillo suchus belongs to the suborder of Nodosuchia. On its legs were large claws that are theorized to have been used for digging burrows or digging up food. 
It could probably use them for defense as well, but it also would have been able to use its wicked bite for defense too, due to its sharp teeth. Speaking of its teeth, examination of them has led paleontologists to conclude that Armadillosuchus was most likely omnivorous. The teeth in Armadillosuchus are a bit unusual. It had 7 centimeter long curved teeth which resemble canines, as well as protruding front teeth which resemble incisors, and the conical teeth with shearing edges filling the remainder of its mouth. This is such a curious animal to think about coexisting with the dinosaurs. It's not the kind of animal that comes to mind when you think about what was living at the time, yet it would have had its own little place in the world and was far from the most unusual animal to ever evolve. As far as crocodiles go though, it is probably one of the weirdest compared to what most people generally think of when they picture a crocodile today. Next is a more traditional crocodile, but still an oddball. Laganasuchus, meaning pancake crocodile, is a stomachosuchid crocodiliform from the Cretaceous period, living between 100 and 90 million years ago. It's called pancake crocodile because Laganasuchus has an extremely shallow skull. This was another animal that lived in Niger as well as Morocco in the Upper Cretaceous between 100 to 66 million years ago. Pancake Crocodile was first described in 2009, I believe by the same team that described Anatosuchus, which is cool. They found the duck, croco duck Crocodile, and they found the Pancake Crocodile. What a resume. We currently know of two species within the Laganosuchus genus, and both are represented only by their bottom jaws. Each side of the mouth had 24 teeth, which overall are evenly spaced out from each other, save for the sixth and seventh ones, the sockets of which, where the roots of the teeth are, have merged. Laganosuchus's teeth are theorized to have formed a type of natural fish trap uh, due to how they were positioned. Both species of pancake crocodile would have been between 4 to 6 meters in length, most likely, with much of which would have included their flattened head. The jaws are not thought to have been able to be closed or opened with much speed or with much power due to the amount of muscle that would have been available to open and close them. It is believed, instead, that the animal stayed completely motionless for hours and waited for a fish to just swim into its jaws. The teeth would have basically been cage bars once the jaws were closed, though unfortunately in most fossil specimens the teeth are either missing or were in the process of being replaced when the animal died. Still, this sounds more like a placid crocodile. I'm sure it was a good hunter, and years ago I saw a documentary showing how it used its stay still strategy until a fish swims in to hunt, but it definitely doesn't sound like it would have been as aggressive as something like a saltwater crocodile today. Those animals are powerful and have insane bite forces and actively hunt humans if they decide that they're hungry while we're around. If Leganosuchus was around today, I'd say it probably wouldn't target humans and would prefer if we just left it alone. As I mentioned a minute ago, Leganosuchus was thought to be as long as 6 meters or 20 feet with its flathead taking up more than three feet of the whole body length. The Laganosuchus genus belongs to the extinct Stomasuchid family of crocodiliforms. And yeah, this is another one that we don't have a lot of fossils from, unfortunately. Just bits of the jaw, and we don't even have a complete skull. You know, it's amazing that you can infer and learn so much from so little such as this animal's hunting strategy, basically being a living fish trap with jaws full of spike-like teeth. Hopefully one day we will... Uh, the fact that we have so few fossils right now will change and we'll have a more complete picture of this animal. Until then, I am going to move on to our last prehistoric crocodile of the video. I don't think I can escape this video or this topic without talking about Dinosuchus. So here we go. This is probably the most famous prehistoric crocodile, given how much art of it attacking dinosaurs, usually Tyrannosaurus, exists. Dinosuchus means terrible crocodile, which 
fair. The skull alone was about three-fourths the length of an average person today, and the full animal reached around 32 feet long. Great, another nightmare crocodile to end off with. Dinosuchus is related to modern alligators and caimans, and it lived in the later stages of their Cretaceous, from 82 to 73 million years ago. Now look, another species I'm not going to be able to talk about in the Cretaceous fauna documentary now. Yay, make my own job harder. Dinosuchus was first discovered in the 1850s in North Carolina, though fossils have been found in nine more U.S. states and northern Mexico since then. And for a long time, even today, knowledge of the animal remains incomplete. But we found more fossils and do have an expanded understanding of this massive predator. And it is massive. When people think of crocodiles that ate dinosaurs, this is the animal that they are usually thinking of. Its teeth were built for crushing, and it's theorized that, while this animal was probably capable of eating large dinosaurs, it probably also ate fish, sea turtles, and other aquatic and terrestrial prey, and likely was an opportunist apex predator that stalked the coastal eastern United States and the interior seaway that ran through North America at the time. Its back teeth are theorized to have been used for the particular purpose of crushing sea turtles. As I mentioned, specimens have been found in a wide range, but they're more common in the eastern United States. The 10 states that Dinosuchus fossils have been found in are Montana, Utah, Wyoming, New Mexico, New Jersey, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas, and North Carolina. Fossils have supposedly been found in South Carolina and Delaware too, but they haven't been officially described. Fossils from this genus are most common in the Gulf Coastal Plain region of Georgia, which is an area near the Alabama border. This animal also has a totally unique skull shape, not being found in any other extinct or living crocodiles. Now, I have to address what this animal is most known for in pop culture. Did it eat dinosaurs? Dinosuchus is thought to have employed hunting methods that you see in crocodiles today. It's theorized that it would wait for dinosaurs to come down to the water's edge and ambush them. Think how crocodiles in Africa will do the same thing with, say, a wildebeest. The animal is also believed to have been capable of performing a death roll, so it's possible that it could have drowned and eaten dinosaurs. In Dinosuchus's eastern range, no theropods, or any known dinosaurs, grew as large as it, which means it was likely the apex predator in the area. So did it eat dinosaurs? I'd say it's very possible. At the very least, Dinosuchus was probably capable of killing large dinosaurs if it needed to. And since they could live for 50 years, I can imagine it being a lifelong enemy to some dinosaur individual that has to drink from the pond it lives in every day. It'd be quite the story to think up. Okay, I will wrap this one up here. I addressed what everyone wants to know about this one, and I want to keep these sections short. So we'll move on. If you want to learn more, I encourage you to research this topic and discover some of this really cool stuff for yourself. You won't regret it. It's fascinating. We all know that Tyrannosaurus rex is quite possibly the most famous dinosaur of all time. But where did it come from? Well, it might shock you to learn it was from small beginnings. We have fossils of the ancestors of the mighty T-Rex going back throughout the Cretaceous, and they steadily get smaller as we go down the family tree. So, what was at the Tyrannosaurus family tree's base? Which was the first? To quote the very first episode of Walking with Caveman, but supposing we could go back not just one generation, or two generations, or even three generations, but 300 generations, or 3,000 back to a hundred thousand generations, if not more. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Travel back to the Cretaceous and go from the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the king, down its family line, all the way back to the literal Dawn Tyrant, Eo Tyrannus in the early Cretaceous, and see where Tyrannosaurs had their beginnings. Could Eo Tyrannus be a dinosaur that set so much in motion? and would lead to the king of dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous millions of years after it was gone? The little dinosaur that made so much possible? Or did it? 
we're not just going to take an in-depth look at this dinosaur, but we're also going to address if this actually is the ancestor of Tyrannosaurus rex at all. It's much more ancient than T-Rex, yes, but did it lead to the king of dinosaurs, or is it something else? An offshoot, a cousin, or ancestor? Where in the family tree does it go? I hope this question sounds interesting to you. So today, you're going to meet an obscure dinosaur from the early Cretaceous, and the question of the day surrounding it that we will examine is if it is an ancestor to the Tyrannosaurus rex. Yes, Spino, look at its fluffy feathers. So, this is Eotyrannus, the dawn tyrant, the possible distant ancestor of the T-Rex from millions of years earlier. First topic of discussion, its biology. Now, the paleobiology of this animal is a bit dubious, since we have so few fossils of it. There is a lot of guesswork here, like with Aurorn, if you remember that video. Or Helicoprion, if you remember that one instead. If you recall there, the, for the longest time, we didn't even know how that one's teeth fit into its mouth. Eotyrannus, though, likely was similar to other early tyrannosaurs as far as diet, behavior, and lifestyle went. And by that, I mean likely more akin to those of the smaller ones that were earlier on rather than the larger theropods that came about later in the Cretaceous. So let's bring up a sample from a pool of early tyrannosaurs. Tyrannosaurids have a high body mass even compared to other theropods, and this is seen in almost all of them, so we can assume it applied to Eotyrannus too. But what more can we gather from Tyrannosaurus as a whole? Let's have a look at Stochiosaurus, an early Tyrannosaur as well. In fact, it's one of the earliest. Let's look at how it lived, as it might be similar to how Eotyrannus lived. Eotyrannus was larger, but we can still make the comparison. Living about 150 million years ago, Stochiosaurus is a small early Tyrannosaurid from the late Jurassic period that lived in Utah. Like with Eotyrannus, the holotype specimen was not an adult, but a juvenile. Early on, this early Tyrannosaur could not be put into a certain family, but interestingly, it was found that this animal and Eotyrannus actually share some features including a poster dorsally inclined ridge on the lateral side of the ilium. Now this was a very early tyrannosaur, very close to the base of the family tree as a whole, and it lived in a flourishing world. It likely hunted and maybe even preyed upon animals in a similar way to Eotyrannus, maybe more likely to have eaten early mammals since it was smaller than the larger dinosaur. We'll cover Eotyrannus' diet in a few minutes, but for now let's focus on using early Tyrannosaurs to fill in some of the blank spaces on the map that is Eotyrannus. But, also something that should be noted is just because you're similar doesn't mean your diet and lifestyles were. And that is important to remember. I do a lot of speculatory behavior estimates in these kinds of videos, and this is no exception. For example, early in human evolution, when there were all kinds of hominids across Africa that branched off from shared ancestors, they all lived their own lifestyles and maybe ate different types of food compared to others. Some ate food others couldn't eat, and some met animals that others didn't, which affected their lives and behaviors. Man, I'm pulling from all the knowledge I've gained in my last paleo videos for this one. I feel like this is my final exam. Some early mammals this animal lived alongside of, and probably ate, included docodonts, symmetrodonts, and... It's a tongue twister, try saying this five times fast. Docodonts, symmetrodonts, and triconodonts. It is likely that these early tyrannosaurs had similar lifestyles as a whole. Being smaller compared to other Tyrannosaurs of the Lake Cretaceous, they likely faced the same type of hardships in life. But that is an estimated guess. Again, their lives could be very different for the reasons I mentioned a minute ago when mentioning hominids. By the way, this is all still in relation to Stochiosaurus. We'll cover all of this when it comes to Eotyrannus in just a minute. Early basal Tyrannosaurs have fossil evidence of being feathered, such as DeLong. Eotyrannus likely had at least some feather covering on its body as well. Later Tyrannosaurs, though likely did not, at least this is suggested by fossilized skin that we have, though it is also possible that they retained feathers on different parts of the body. 
as the skin impressions we have are from only a few limited spots, some of which are unlikely to have had feathers at all. Feathers are also not limited to the smaller animals in the superfamily. Larger early tyrannosaurs are also known to have had feathers. These dinosaurs likely had feathers all across their bodies. Using early tyrannosaurs as a pool to draw from, we can look at common traits shared by most to get an idea into what Eotyrannus' biology might have looked like. With its fossils being so fragmentary, we can only really guess right now. So now, let's get back to the main dinosaur this video focuses on. The world Eotyrannus lived in is thought to have been warm and human, comparable to how the Mediterranean is today. It is thought that, based on the fossils we have from the formation the Dawn Tyrant was found in, the weather didn't have high levels of seasonal rain. However, we know that there was a wet season because of the fungal decay in plant material from the plant debris beds. These signs of fungal decay occur frequently in the beds as well, indicating an annual wet season. There is also evidence the region was fire and drought resistant. Some of the animals Eotyrannus shared its world with were the Spinosaurids, Reparovenator, and Ceratosuchops, and also the Neovenator, which is a pretty well-known dinosaur. Another well-known dinosaur that Eotyrannus lived alongside of was the Iguanodon. Other dinosaurs also included Brystonius, Mantelisaurus, and Valdosaurus along with several sauropods and one ankylosaur called Polacanthus, which, hey, I know that one. Anyone who grew up with walking with dinosaurs should. There were also mammal species that were likely prey to Eotyrannus, as I mentioned earlier, so your and mine distant ancestors. But hey, technically yours lived because you're here now watching this video. I'm going to move on now before I fill you with existential dread. <laughs> but we really are more lucky to be here than we'll ever truly know. Some of the mammals included Eobatar and Yaverlistius. I hope that's right. I don't know why they insist on giving these tiny little mammals the most convoluted names ever. Now, I'm not actually going to go into detail about any of these dinosaurs or mammals, because you'll probably remember I'm doing a big Cretaceous fauna project eventually, probably this winter, and I'm going to need 60 animals to talk about because it's going to be a full-length, multi-part documentary about the animals that existed throughout the Cretaceous. Just know that they were prey to dinosaurs. Mammals were definitely not the top at this time. If I decide to cover these guys in that video, we can all learn about them together then. But for now, let's move on to the discovery of the fossils. So, we don't actually know where this animal was found. The exact location of the holotype specimen has not been revealed for a few reasons. One is due to its importance, apparently, and the possibility of new material to be collected as the coastline recedes. So fair enough. I guess they want to keep it a secret so random people can't just walk in and maybe walk out with the only fossils and fragments of what could be new specimens of Eotyrannus or new species altogether. But hey, from what we know, the specimen was found on the Isle of Wight, which, hey, that's a familiar name. We talked about that in another video. Look at that. That's cool. It's a small world sometimes. A single claw was the first fossil discovered in an excavation of the site, and from there, more bones were found shortly afterward. The fragmentary specimen was heavily researched by scientists from the University of Portsmouth in Portsmouth, England. England? and from the Natural History Museum in London, England. Six years later, in 2001, the fossils were given a name, Eotyrannus, and in 2022, a monograph of the animal was finally published. A monograph is basically just a write-up on a subject, typically by a single author. Now, on screen is a reconstruction of the skeleton based on what few bones we actually have of it. We... Really, always seem to just talk about the fragmentary animals here, don't we? Hmm. 
Now, let's actually have a good look at this animal before we start addressing where it fits in the family line of tyrannosaurs and if it is in fact an ancestor of the king. So, Eotyrannus is a very fragmentary dinosaur, but we know a few vital things about it from our limited fossil bones. And in fact, from these limited bones, we can see that this animal has several traits unique to it when compared to other tyrannosaurs. For example, just looking at the holotype specimen, we see that the rostral end of the dentary possesses a concave notch, and this notch houses the mesial, the direction toward the anterior midline in a dental arch. The rostral mesial margin of the notch also has a dorsally directed prong that curves laterally. This is just one example of an odd feature compared to other known tyrannosaurs. Now, an unfortunate thing about the holotype specimen, aside from being fragmentary, is how spread apart it was. Prior to being fossilized, the animal was disarticulated, likely being scavenged by other animals. Parts of its skeleton were scattered all around the formation it was found in. However, again, we can learn a few vital things about the specimen from just a few broken pieces. One thing we know is that the holotype specimen was an individual who was not yet fully mature by the time it died. The adult size of the animal would be larger than the specimen we have, even if it had been fully intact. It is thought that the holotype individual represents a subadult of the species. However, on the flip side of that coin, fragmentary remains can also make certain bones hard to identify. There are pieces of the cranium that we can't identify in this animal, and a few other pieces that were originally identified when the specimen was first found have also since been figured out to have been wrong. Anyway, Eotyrannus was a theropod carnivorous dinosaur, and it had a slender-built body and was able to grasp prey with its long arms. So, the big question this whole video has been building up to. Is this animal an ancestor to the T-Rex from hundreds of thousands of generations before? Is this the one out of all the early Tyrannosaurs that existed at this time that we have to choose from? No. At most, it just shares a direct common ancestor with the T-Rex. And for a very specific reason. Eotyrannus lived in Europe in the early Cretaceous, and T-Rex lived in North America at the end of the late Cretaceous. These two continents were already split apart by the time Eotyrannus evolved, so there is no way for it to have been a direct ancestor of the T-Rex. Now, before doing this, I didn't know there were Tyrannosaurs in Europe. I thought they were exclusive to North America, so I began my research thinking that maybe this was T-Rex direct ancestor, especially with its name being Don Tyrant, but it's not. They're the same family of dinosaurs. They both have evolved from a shared ancestor, but these two are not in the same line. They're part of different branches of the Tyrannosaur family tree. Now, here's a fun fact. One of the most identifiable features of the T-Rex were its tiny arms with two fingers. Well, as I mentioned, Eotyrannus had long arms, and its hands had three fingers instead of two. Now, on screen is a family tree. As you can see, all these animals, and Eotyrannus is basically a distant cousin of the line that led to Tyrannosaurus rex. It's part of the Tyrannosaurus superfamily, but not the line that led to T-Rex, as I said earlier. A 2022 study concluded that Eotyrannus should be classified as an intermediate gracile tyrannosaurid, one that is more closely related to the true tyrannosaurids, but one that lacks some of the features found on the more advanced members of the extended family tree. This also leads to a theory that megaraptors might be tyrannosaurids. Eotyrannus was also thought to be a megaraptor at one point, but this seems to not be the case. So... Eotyrannus is not the ancestor of the T-Rex. The two share a common ancestor, but are part of two different lines of the Tyrannosaur superfamily. 
Its line did not lead to the king of dinosaurs, and by the time T-Rex would come to be, this magnificent animal would be long gone. The legacy it left behind was not the king of dinosaurs, but instead the fragmentary, fossilized bones. Well, that's going to do it, and I hope you are all paying attention. It's time for your pop quiz. Please close your notebooks and take out a paper and number it 1 to 10. Okay, I'm just kidding. What I do hope is that you found this deep dive into the family tree of the T-Rex as interesting as I did. I never knew there were Tyrannosaurs outside of North America. Tyrannosaurs are actually a family group that I don't really research that much, so there's a lot that I don't know. I knew that some, I knew some that lived outside of North America, but I didn't know they lived outside of North America. So this was a very interesting video to research, and it's one of the reasons I love these kinds of videos. I get to learn about so many amazing animals I didn't know about, like Gracipithecus, Auroran, Smock, Anatosuchus, and of course, Eotyrannus. While it wasn't an ancestor of the T-Rex, it is still a fascinating animal, even if it didn't live on in the King of Dinosaurs millions of years after it was gone. And I can't believe it was found on the Isle of Wight of all places, too. That's hilarious that that little island came up again in one of these documentary videos. I promise I did not do that on purpose. That was a genuine shock for me that we ended back on the same little isle of all the places on Earth. If you want to see my last video that we talked about the Isle of Wight then check out my video on the HMS Eurydice, a ghost ship witnessed by Winston Churchill. I'll link it in the description. It's a very interesting story. As for the next video, while we're on the topic of ships... I'm not going to say what it is just yet, but you all seem to really like the ship videos, so I think you're really going to like this one if you do. It's a fascinating story that you probably have not heard before, but you most likely have heard what came about because of this ship. Until then, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you have a good one. Expect videos to start coming on a more weekly basis now because... I now have a job, and I cannot dedicate as much time in a single day to make these as I used to. But nonetheless, I will still make them the best that I can. And until the next one, as always, thank you for watching. margin of the notch also has a dorsally oh trying to record a video with tank in the house is so difficult and there he goes again bark 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 still barking oh dog give it up the squirrels do not care that you're barking at them